Hello and welcome to the Mighty 90s Movie and TV Podcast. I'm Dom. And I'm Simon. And on this episode we are diving into... The, the Mighty, Mighty Ducks! Whack! So, welcome to the Mighty 90s Movie and TV Podcast, where it's always 10.30 at night, so it's time to grab the snacks from the sweet cupboard and move on upstairs to settle in as tonight's movie for, for debate is The Mighty Ducks. Today is a really special podcast because we're actually joined by one of the cast members of the film. So Matt Doherty is actually joining us on this podcast. So we're both super excited, Simon more so than ever, because he's such a massive super fan. Uh, and me because I get to talk to someone who's actually in the film and also quite a big fan of the film. So really looking forward to having him, him on. So here we go to discuss The Mighty Ducks with a Mighty Duck, Matt Doherty. How, how are you, Matt? I'm pretty good, considering the whole world's uh, pitched on the end of uh, of uh, craziness and uncertainty. How about yourselves? We're okay. We're surviving here in the UK. I don't think it has hit quite as hard here as it has in some other places in Europe. How How is it there? I'm assuming you're in California. Yeah, I just got back from... Um, I was doing a like a appearance, a promotional thing in Minnesota. And then I was in Chicago with visiting my family, and then I just got back to LA yesterday. Very nice. Well, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be with us. This is the first time we've ever had a guest uh, on our podcast. So before we go into the film, we'll just go into talking a little bit about you, if that's okay, and about what you know what you've been up to and sort of your uh, career to date. And then we can talk a bit about like your music and all of that stuff, uh, which we'd love to hear about. And then we'll go into talking about the film, what we remember about it, um, and then sort of go through it sort of scene by scene, spending more time on some scenes and sort of skipping over some of the other ones and just love to hear your insight and, you know, anything you sort of have to say about it, really. Well, do you have a security clearance for that or no? I mean, I, I'm not sure if one needs that, but because the, the mouse, the mouse may knock down your door, you know? That's, that's true. <laughs> Mickey's going to come knocking. Yeah, I mean, that's proprietary uh, duck knowledge, so... Uh... <laughs> also run through this brain of mine that's you know uh just doesn't remember what i had for breakfast so it's great when in doubt I'll, when in doubt i'll just make up shit how about that that's, that's perfect that's what that's how we get through life so that sounds great <laughs> so to start with thank you for joining us matt this is what i know about you from online research and from listening to you on other podcasts sort of doing more of a straightforward sort of interview setup and you've been on Quite, uh, quite a few podcasts, so I don't really want to tread over too much, you know, ground that you've already been on. But what I have found out is that... I'm, I'm, I'm very big in very small circles. <laughs> you were down to the final four kids when uh, auditioning for Kevin McAllister in Home Alone. Yeah, that's true. Which is awesome. Uh, you still got a, a small part in Home Alone as Stefan, and I found you on the Blu-ray at 46 minutes and 28 seconds. In the blue sweater, in the blue polo sweater that you could probably clean dishes with because it's got a, like a bit of a, like a Brillo pad to it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I saw you and I thought, I'm just like looking at an old friend from across the room and there you were under the Christmas tree. Yeah, that was my introductory to, to film was, uh, was being almost cut out and somehow in the movie and through some loophole, uh, yeah. And uh, it was this mix of excitement and disappointment all at once. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw uh, on the on the DVD Blu-ray there was a deleted scene where I had you in as well in in the airport. Yeah, which I just found out about. Yeah, which is awesome and actually a really good scene. It's a it's a shame they didn't put that in the movie. I can understand why they wanted to stay in uh, with Kevin. Uh, so I think that's the whole. Um, when they tested the movie, they were like, the movie is with Home Alone, you know? And, and, and the criminals and Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern. So that makes a lot of sense. You, at some point, when you were about 15, dated Anna Klumski, the girl from My Girl. That's a bit of an exaggeration and a, I would say maybe fake news in our climate. Uh, I would say we, we were, uh, we were, long time friends when we were kids because we would often um i wouldn't say we even knew what dating was 
but uh, uh, we did a bunch of commercials together when we were little and our, uh, uh, like our moms were really good friends. So that might be the real truth. But the truth is, is like, yeah, we were, I mean, literally my first commercial was with her, which is always a strange, weird fact. And there was also this strange thing where like my next, like about a block of where I grew up, Jason Weaver lived, who was the um, uh, voice of the Lion King. He did the songs. So it was this strange Chicago weirdness that like there were so many people that ended up with some really great fortune that we were all crossing paths together when we were very little jason weaver of course was in smart guy marcus and smart guy yeah and he was uh, i just remember he lived like a block and a half away and had a like a he had the basketball net in the neighborhood that we'd all go play at yeah and he was the he was like yeah i guess i got this movie in, in lion king and he was like a block away it was crazy <laughs> that's awesome yeah, yeah. Anna Klumsky was uh, was a mermaid in a Long John Silver's commercial that uh, I was. It was my very first job that I got my union card with, and then we did uh, maybe three or four other commercials together. And she was out doing My Girl, and I was doing Ducks, and then I um, I was up for My Girl too, and which would have been really fun, but it didn't happen. Because we know Macaulay Culkin obviously didn't make it to My Girl too, so it would have been brilliant. No, I think I think he had that beast thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> the whole death thing <laughs> thwarted again by the calkins <laughs> i also have here that you originally in in the ducks audition for fulton reed's uh character before being cast as dave slash lester averman is that right simon you, you you got your you got your uh you got your deep dive research ready uh yeah that that is a that is a true statement yeah i i also think i may have auditioned for another part they were just hand, they just didn't know there were so many of us, but I know that Fulton was one of them, which is ridiculous because he's supposed to be the big dude <laughs> and I'm not the big dude. I'm many things, but I'm not the big dude. Did, would it make you feel strange if you knew that I was actually sat here right now in Fulton Reed's actual uh, Team USA tracksuit from D2? Would that make you feel a little bit strange? I mean, if you were pantless and wearing high heels, it might be a little weird, but like, that's, uh, that's fine with me. <laughs> I, I mean, it makes me feel strange. I've got to sit next to him. So <laughs> I totally remember that. I mean, that, those things were ridiculous. I, they had like stars on the sleeves, right? And they got stripes, right? Is that right? That's all right. Yeah. You kind of, you kind of feel like a Russian gangster in it. Totally. <laughs> And that's how I want to feel every day. Yeah. So that's that's the sweet spot. <laughs> you were also in the Mike Myers movie, so I married an axe murderer, which is an awesome credit to have. Yeah, that was uh, that was an experience. That's for sure. That was um, I don't think a scene ever took longer to shoot. So uh, I mean, it was like any <laughs> like weeks. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was a trip. I got to be in San Francisco and which is an amazing city to shoot in. Um, and I mean, that movie's a cult classic. I mean, you talk about legends of comedy, right? Alan Arkin, Phil Hartman. Uh, I mean, just, these are just legends. So it's uh, to be in that film, you know, Brenda Fricker who had just won an Academy Award and to hang out with her. Um, and like, all I remember was that Anthony Opaga and who was, uh, and um, Brenda Fricker were both very, you know, serious actors. And neither one of them could get through a take without laughing because Mike Myers was just so ridiculous. And then, and then I would start giggling. So it was like being in like church as a kid or something where you like the giggles were just were contagious. So it took us like two weeks to shoot that scene. <laughs> so it's ridiculous. Yeah. Would I be right in saying so in your uh, current incarnation, you are a writer, actor, creator and musician involved with theatre work and you released your debut album Dignity at the end of 2018, which is a blend of sort of blues and country. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm playing with a band I used to play. We used to play in a jug band with for years and we're uh, we're in the studio right now. We're called the middle class. Um, we would start off our our concerts and we would say we're the middle class or what's left of it because there's three of us and one guy plays plays pots and pans with the spoons and uh so we're we're back in the uh studio recording and uh so that, that's an accurate statement then i also i also teach and facilitate um like writing groups um and try to do that for professionals and then as well as like uh in residential treatment facilities and 
for people who are recovering from drug addiction and alcoholism and stuff like that. So I also work in that field. Oh, wow. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. I made, I made a decision a few years ago that I, as an artist, you, you kind of got to find things to do in between gigs. And I was trying to find something that um, was a benefit to others and that I wasn't like natural and at, and so that's kind of somehow what I stumbled into. Oh, that's very cool. And the, I, I listened to the album and I'm not just saying it because we're talking, uh, it's really, really good. Um, I particularly oh, thank you, like um, Mr. Seeger, that's my favorite. I like Jericho. Um, it's a really, really nice album. It's sort of quite easy listening to. I was listening to it while walking my dog and I was having a good time. So I'd highly recommend it. I'm glad I could help your dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> which which could lead us into some mighty ducks scenes in a minute so. oh that's a good one because we could put it in the purse right yeah <laughs> yeah totally exactly that so what is, is this the first of like many albums that you're hoping to do or how did you get into music oh i've been i've been playing music since uh on the set of ducks too and um um my brother was a is a, a tremendous musician and um uh, he taught me a few things and, and then, um, and then, yeah, over the years, I just, I think I, I think I did like many years ago. I just was, when you, when you grow up in, in Hollywood and I mean, and do this stuff, it's like after a while, you just want to keep doing creative things. So I just, you know, I got into playing music. I mean, there's an old joke that, you know, my friends who are musicians all want to be actors and my friends that are actors all want to be musicians. <laughs> and they intersect in, as a, in the biker band and as bikers on, um, on uh, uh, Son of, Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> That's like the strange intersection point. <laughs> like a lot of my friends who are musicians, they're all actors and they all end up as uh, extras on uh, Sons of Anarchy. And then my friends who are, who are actors and want to be musicians end up in like Motley Crue cover bands. So it's like this uh, strange phenomenon. Before we go forward, just so that people know, where can they download and access your music? I'm assuming Apple Music, that's where I got it, but Spotify is on all of the platforms. Uh, I guess cassette, cassette tapes are coming back. <laughs> 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 no, it's actually true where all the hipsters are. You know, I don't know where the London version of it is, but over here in Silver Lake now, like uh, in LA, they have like, that's the thing. People are actually releasing cassette tapes willingly. So it's really fascinating. Um, you can find me on Spotify, Apple Music, all those streaming places. Uh, my website, which is uh, my name, Matt Doherty, uh, dot net, has a little link to everything. Um, and then I always ask that, you know, with the cuts on Spotify, if like all that stuff is out there, I put it out for free. But if you like something, then, you know, download a song and then that helps uh, artists everywhere. You know what I mean? For sure. For sure. Dom. Before re-watching The Mighty Ducks 1, D1, what do you remember about this movie? Well, I remember... Uh, I, I remembered a fair bit, I think. I remembered, obviously, Lester Aberman. What a great character. Uh, <laughs> I remember uh, Emilia Estevez being in it. I remember... Quack, 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 quack. Gotta get the W. Oh, there you go. A lot of ice hockey. Just like, loads of little like bits like that. Um, I remember <laughs> you liking it so much that we'd, we'd watched it quite a lot when we were younger at your house and to the point where we even started to play hockey but whoa you guys played hockey in england but we didn't play ice hockey okay we yeah. played we we we, we uh, manipulated the rules a little bit um in that we played in simon's back garden so like backyard and we played with like normal field hockey uh, or i had a normal field hockey stick and you had an ice hockey stick. And we would play ice hockey rules in his back garden. On, so On grass. On grass. <laughs> so we would end up battering each other in his back garden over a, over a ball. Because the puck obviously wouldn't move. But that, that's, that's my fondest memory of it, I think. <laughs> what about yourself? Uh, I remember... Well, these films are absolutely massive to me. Uh, D2 was my, was my major jam, <laughs> if I'm being completely honest. But... D1 was important as well. I remember seeing the dog poo scene at my uh, childminder's house, which childminder is what we call like a babysitter. Yep. And um, I remember seeing that section and then having to go home and being really upset that like I wasn't able to watch the full movie. I was probably about six at this point, five or six. We're, we're 32 now, so <laughs> maybe I, I can't do the maths. But Old enough. 
And then I remember obviously getting it at home uh, and my dad's sort of mum and dad getting the video and whatever and just absolutely loving this film. All three of them, and as Dom said, I, I tried to learn how to roll the blade uh, from the concrete, which roller blading is not particularly very popular here in like the rain that we have for like nine months a year <laughs> yeah yeah rain and rollerblading is a great combo. <laughs> and then i actually had ice skating lessons uh to try and learn to, to be able to play ice hockey but there is no ice hockey here like in the uk like hardly any at all anyway then i had this memory the other day or yesterday as i was thinking about this podcast and i have kind of a sad memory but maybe we'll find the humor in it so i can laugh through the pain <laughs> but i remember going to secondary school which is what we call high school the secondary the high school i've gone to i didn't really know anyone there we've gone from this really nice sort of quaint little village uh, elementary school and i was sort of shipped away to this other high school away from all of my friends and was a little bit lost and a little bit sad and I was in PE, with, like our physical education, and I'm sat in, I'm in line to do running or whatever, and I look across and I see this kid, and I, for some reason in my head, think, oh, that's Charlie Conway. Like, as in, I don't think, like, that's the actor, Joshua Jackson, and somehow he's magically in my school in the UK. I actually thought, oh my God, that's Charlie Conway, and he's come here to be my friend. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so I, so I, without thinking too much into him, I look at him and say, Charlie? Like, it, expecting him to be like, <laughs> expecting him to be like, Simon, I'm here, the whole ducks are here. Aitman's here, Fulton's here, we're here to be your friends. <laughs> and uh, and I, so I say, I say, Charlie? And he goes, what? <laughs> and then I just sort of retreat back into the shadows. <laughs> realizing what i'd done and that i had said this externally and um he wasn't charlie conway and the ducks weren't there at my school and and that's the end of that story how is that can we laugh at it or no is it too still too raw i think it's i think it's still under the statute of limitations <laughs> so uh uh the uh <laughs> hang on hang on, hang on sorry you were you were a real life Adam Banks. I, I actually think I was sort of doing a Fight Club Tyler Durden situation. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, uh, I guess it goes to show how much these films sort of meant to me because I would go home and like watch watch these films and it'd be like escapism. Um, I mean, you don't need to feel sorry for me. Like I was okay the rest of my life, but just, you know, everyone has these periods that are a little bit difficult and uh, high school was maybe that for me. Matt, what do you remember about the Mighty Ducks? Well, I remember being uh, moving to England and uh, going to the school. <laughs> I knew you were there. I knew it. And like, and this one bloke who uh, kept using the phrase child uh, minder, which made me very confused, uh, 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 said uh, I reminded him of Charlie, which pushed all my buttons because Charlie was the popular kid, and I was like, "Dang, man, he thinks I'm the popular kid, and I'm not." No, I, uh, um, I was just listening to the your story about that. It, I think that actually strikes to the heart of why these movies still um, matter, is because I think it does, uh, you know, especially around that age when, when we're like not quite adults, not quite teenagers, not quite little kids, and. And I think that's, you know, that was the sweet spot where, you know, it's where you don't know if you're playing with toys or you don't know if you should go, you're just, your voice is changed. It's just like, a, it's like that, that time, you know what I mean? And uh, um, I think that it's a really vulnerable time for us as, as, as we're growing up, which is why, like, um, there's so many great movies and books and, and things that are around that time. Uh, I wish there were more, you know, I think that those are like today, you know, I, uh, I was talking with somebody who was involved in, in the making of the movie who I'll have remained nameless. And I asked, uh, I was trying to pitch, um, you know, a coming of age story. And he was like, I, you know, I wish we could make this, but we can't even make this right now. It would cost too much money and this and that. And like, and it made, we both kind of mourned the fact that like, uh, it would be really impossible to make a movie like that today. And, uh, and that made, you know, that, and, the demand for it and you're just saying like why it's so personal and important i can't tell you how many times i've heard 
things like this where, where people, we all identify as members of the team, you know, or uh, being an underdog, being an outsider. And I think that that's, um, there's a reason why I still a couple of times a year fly to different towns across the world and meet people that this mattered to them. So I, uh, and I don't take that like lightly, even though we all make fun and we make jokes. It's like, that's a pretty, that's a, that says something, you know? So, um, but what I remember was I just, we didn't know we were making the Mighty Ducks. I mean, geez, I just was glad to be on a movie set. Um, I had never really been on one for more than a couple of days. Uh, my dad had just lost his job and my mom was about to lose hers. So it was a really trying time uh, personally. Um, so it was a really, like a weird time where my dad had been downsized, corp, a corporate downsizing in America. And, um, and he was kind of victim of that uh, and, or just because it was that time and every 20 years or so it happens in America. And uh, but what a strange experience that was to be on a movie set, but still like, uh, like I remember my dad would give me an allowance because I had no real concept of like, <laughs> I just didn't know. I was like, he's like, I'm going to give you your allowance, you know, and I, uh, um, and we'd go to school a couple hours a day. And the best part was the hockey camp. Um, and I remember, uh, like, I'd never really been good at a sport before, and I'd always wanted to be good at a sport. And our coach who trained us, Jack White, you know, really trained us and and kind of gave the confidence to, for the first time in my life, I felt like this, you know, you know, I was this tiny little, you know, somewhat chubby kid sometimes. And uh, so it was like, I felt like good at a sport. And uh, that was a really powerful thing when you're 14, 15 years old. And you're at that vulnerable point in your life. So that's what I remember. I remember, and then, and then afterwards we find out we made this, you know, movie that was like this huge movie. I mean, I don't think anybody knew it. And then all of a sudden they release it. They found this secret weekend in October or whenever it was. And, and then uh, word of mouth spread and it became a thing and, and uh, enough for Disney to want to change a sport. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous to think that like what we did um, made hockey, um, what it is in a lot of ways, you know, it's a, it's now a sport where like, not just used to be able to smoke in the back of a, of a hockey game, you know, and then Disney gets involved and it becomes this, uh, this thing where families go and all that stuff. And, uh, and I also know that the mighty ducks around the country and, and also help play roles with teams doing, um, outreach and making the sport more affordable for, cause it's an expensive sport, you know? So I think that um, all of those things contributed to like these amazing things and, but we didn't know it. I mean, I just was like, I'm going to Minnesota and it's cold and I'm from Chicago and it's cold there. And, uh, and then like we, uh, we get out on the ice on day one and we all lied to get the part. And the guy says to us, uh, the who's coaching us. I didn't know him. His name was, who ended up being a big influence in my life, Jack White. And, and he told us that we would be skating around the rink backwards in an hour. And we're like, no way. And, and then we were, and it was like that feeling that like, uh, um, which was just like the movie. And I think that's what makes it so, um, so special, you know, cause the making of it actually mirrored what the message of the film was. And did you feel, did you feel like a team, like when you were at this training camp and, and learning to skate with these guys, you, you felt like part of a team? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that that's why like, I mean, we're all friends today and like when we do see each other it's like uh that all started because it's like you're it's the it's like oh like playing uh dom and uh simon you guys are in the back playing hockey and it's the same thing you're you're talking about it today so well that's awesome and completely you uh the mighty ducks films did sort of transform the sport in terms of you've got british kids trying to play it on grass you know <laughs> across the world so yeah right yeah well, just uh, just one other thing I just wanted to quickly add uh, for context that, Matt, you and I actually started uh, communicating about a year ago. Yes, we did. We met on the underground black market of Mighty Ducks screen used and production used jerseys to sort of celebrate the, the nostalgia and the, the great impact and how much I love these films. I bought your jersey from the mighty ducks too uh, at the end when you change the jerseys you know to the new mighty ducks logo and uh, it came with a certificate of authenticity etc but i wanted to try and get it authenticated by you and you were very kind and gracious in 
helping me with that over email and we were checking the inside of like stitching and all kinds of things um but it was an amazing way to yeah be able to meet you and you were incredibly uh kind with your time yeah and it's great to be able to do that yeah i i asked if there was i asked if there was blood all over it and that would be the time <laughs> Well, I have, uh, hope you'll be proud to know that it is framed in my house. Uh, I'm not quite sure how my wife feels about it, but it's there. Oh, excellent. Are, are there grass stains from playing field hockey in it is the question. <laughs> not yet, but, but maybe in summer. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for all of that. We'll move over to Dom, who will tell us uh, some trivia about the film and what he digged up on his deep dive. And then we will move in to this classic. Okay, so The Mighty Ducks is obviously a huge Disney production. It was released in October 1992, so we would have been five when it was released. So sorry if that you know, makes you feel a little bit older, but you're only a little bit older, so it's fine. It's another century, let's just call it that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's IMDb score, so we play a little game. Would anyone, uh, so let's say, Matt, if you'd like to guess the IMDb score. The IMDb score of the film? Yeah. Like, what's its ranking? Yeah, or the, the, the rating, yeah. Like oh, 10. the rating. I, I, out of 10, I would say 7.5. Close. It's, it's 6.5. I would have rated it a lot higher. It's at 6.5? Well, they should they should get out of their bubble. Absolutely. <laughs> I think some people are delusional and they're hating. <laughs> I reckon that's all people that love the little giants that are trying to do it to get a rivalry yeah. going. Yeah, uh, there's some ladybug. It's them Sandlot people again, man. I'm yeah. telling you. <laughs> yeah. Or it's those it's those uh, media farms in like countries where you have people like spam botting and clicking on things. <laughs> it's a conspiracy. Yeah, that's for sure. Definitely. But out, out of all the films that we've covered so far, this one is the one I don't agree with the rating. I think so far, definitely don't agree with it. Should Excellent. Um, Rotten Tomatoes as well has given it only twenty three percent, which is just shocking. That's garbage. Wow. So they are they are rotten tomatoes. Considering considering the, you know the, the the people that wrote it, the directors and the talent within the film, it it's just it's just ludicrous. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, we're gonna have to. Uh, we're gonna have to. We're gonna have to start a revolution on that one. I mean, I know. Let's get our priorities straight. The world's in a really tough spot right now. <laughs> you know, uh, we're facing economic collapse and pandemic. But like, Rotten Tomatoes really needs to get their shit in order. You know, <laughs> <laughs> definitely think we could get that trending. <laughs> so the the writer of the film was uh, Stephen Brill, who co-wrote Little Nicky and directed Mr. Deeds, uh, and has a cameo in all three films. Do you remember him being in the film? Oh yeah, for sure. He plays the lawyer that that puts um, uh, Gordon in jail, and uh, he's in he's in a little part in all of them. Yeah. Yeah. And Steve Steve was I I think just like you know like a lot of us like a struggling you know actor between gigs just scribbling stuff out doing comedy and and then he made this uh, he made this script and it was like this record breaking time. It got somehow to to Jordan Kerner's uh, and John Abnett's office. And then within like, I think they said nine months they were in production, which is like unheard of. Um, but I remember him and Peter Berg and Mark Marin all kind of mythically shared the same one bedroom apartment. So, which is kind of funny to think of <laughs> the, those three people are, you know, extremely talented and um, they were all just kind of out of work and buds and, uh, yeah, Steve. And I remember meeting Steve with uh, um, Adam Sandler at the set of Ducks on uh, at the um, premiere because him and Adam, I guess they were they knew each other from stand up days. I don't know. I don't know what the whole root of their relationship is, but they go way back. And so that's why he's been working with um, the Happy Madison Company for years because they go way, way back. Adam Sandler is a huge hero of mine. Also, <laughs> so. He was and he's just, you know. And he was, uh, they were there with Elizabeth Shue. And I remember me- and who was like a huge star at the time. And I remember meeting uh, her at the Ducks premiere and we were all crushing on Elizabeth Shue because <laughs> she was like uh, uh, Adventures in Babysitting and all that, right? Oh, that's a classic. <laughs> I actually watched that the other day. That's for the first time. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. And, and I hear the original movie was called Bombay. So Ducks was originally called Bombay, uh, which on the script that I have, there's a, it actually says that and um, Oh, was that the was that the work that was the working title, wasn't it? It was, but it was also the real original name because the original draft leaned more on Gordon's like 
troubles and it was a little even darker so with like the mix of kids to it had a little bit more of that band news bears um darkness to it and uh so they kind of lightened it up to, to to get that perfect umami they sort of disneyfied it a little bit yeah because he was meant to be a, a bit of a drinker wasn't he and, and have all these problems and yeah and like that the idea of you know going back and giving away something you feel like you've lost and what a great message you know Apparently, Stephen Brill wanted to play Coach Bombay as well, but was told by Disney that they wanted a bigger name, so hence why Emilio Estevez... Well, I, I, according to my sources, they wanted Charlie Sheen, and Charlie Sheen turned it down, so they picked Emilio Estevez instead. Oh, I didn't know that. I always thought, like, maybe it's Harvey Keitel and Martin Sheen, you know, <laughs> for Apocalypse <laughs> Now. Yeah. All I remember was, like, we were in hockey camp, and there we were all rumor there were these rumors like who it was going to be and like it was Kiefer Sutherland, it was this and that. And, oh and like uh, at the time, Emilio Estevez was like one of the biggest names. And, but we, the first thing we all reacted to, and I confirmed this with the guys when I saw them recently was as soon as we heard Emilio Estevez, we immediately jumped to Paul Abdul. <laughs> we were like, <laughs> that, does that mean Paul is coming, man? <laughs> <laughs> did, did you get to meet Paul Abdul? Oh my God. I, I like, hang out at the bagel machine or whatever they we could toast bagels at craft service like just to stand and toast a bagel next to her it was like we were all everybody we were all like we were all crawling over each other just to like you know like stand in the uh next to her and all that so yeah she was she was there she was there a little while yeah and so were emilio's kids which i think was the main thing of why he wanted to make the movie was he wanted to make a movie for his kids nice oh very cool so the director was stephen herrick who's, uh, other than the Mighty Ducks, of course, most notable work as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, uh, The Three Musketeers, and 101 Dalmatians. So he's quite a, a Disney favourite. Do you remember uh, how he was on set? Was it was he great to work for? I mean, yeah. I mean, I like I said, I had no context. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... Uh, I mean, there was this dude in a hat who just told me what to do. It was great. It's like, okay. You know. Just point and go. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, um, yeah, he was great. Uh, I think anybody who can manage all of us kids and somehow not pull their hair out and while we're all on ice um, in freezing Minnesota winter deserves a medal of freedom. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So the, the film cost $14 million to make. I assume you got... 13 of those millions yeah i i put i demanded i demanded like 13 fourteenths of the budget. excellent <laughs> well they saw your five seconds in home alone and they knew they needed you right yeah i said i'd bring my blue sweater yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is the kid we need it uh and then at the box office it made 50.8 million so just over 50 million uh, which is really good because I, I find it really hard to find Disney financials, I think they're, they're blocking me. Like you said, the mouse is coming for me now. Um, so it's quite nice to actually find uh, some money on a, on a film that, that they've produced. Uh, and what's also quite interesting is that after the film was released, quite possibly unbeknown to uh, NHL uh, novices like myself, they actually created a, a hockey team called the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim, which is very cool. I think they're just called the Ducks of Anaheim now. Because Disney, Disney actually paid for everything and like made the team because of yep. the film. Uh, they were like a big success, and now they're like huge N- NHL team. Uh, yes, they are. And I have, I remember skating on that rink before they opened it up. Yeah. Um, am I right in saying that the first event they held at that rink was filming for D two for like the final game there? That's that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Well, they did have a game in the garden. Uh, they, they didn't have the ice down, so they put grass down and they let people play this <laughs> this mashup of field hockey and floor hockey. Uh, but that's not very publicized. I think there's same a, rules, same rules. I think I think we've got a business going. I think <laughs> I think us three, you put your 13 million in, me and Don will put our expertise in, and I think we could take this all the way to the bank. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, well, the only reason why they can't confirm it is because supposedly Charlie Conway was there, but no one knows if it was really ever now. <laughs> <laughs> An absolute travesty is that the film was only nominated for two awards, but sadly not Oscars. So uh, all of all of the, I don't know if, if you... Yeah, the Rotten Tomato Award. <laughs> no. <laughs> but all, all of the uh, the young artists in it were, were nominated for an award. Did you know you were nominated? 
Uh, I do remember this, that there was some kind of, uh, was it for MTV or Nickelodeon or something? What was it for? It was like... Uh... Uh, well, I've just got the Young Artist Awards. And yeah, and it was an outstanding young ensemble cast in a motion picture, and all of you were nominated. Yeah, we must have lost to one of those other films that lowered our uh, our rating, huh? Yeah, that was. Um, yeah, I I, de I definitely remember reading that somewhere. Yeah, good. Uh, that's that's news to me though. <laughs> well, you you have a, a a nomination that you can now put on your on your resume, like your LinkedIn profile, all of your profiles. Just just check it on there. Wikipedia needs updating. Yeah, I, I'm a 42 year old man who was uh, nominated for a young young a young award. <laughs> get, get it on there. Get it on there. <laughs> so looking into a bit more trivia about the film Jake Gyllenhaal who was unknown at the time apparently auditioned for the role of Charlie Conway but obviously didn't get it but mainly because his parents were a bit upset that he uh, he had gone for it they didn't want him to get this part that's right yeah I've I've actually heard that confirmed uh, on a couple of different sources so I, I believe that is a true statement according to more sources, that some of the young actors, so yourself, all nominated, by the way, claimed that when you auditioned, not you personally, but you as a group, when you auditioned, you you all said you could play hockey, and some of you couldn't. Some? None of us. None of us could. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but did you say you definitely could play? Oh, yeah. You, you, your tr actors are trained from, like, birth to lie to get a job, so... Uh... <laughs> Like, I, I remember saying I could ride a horse to get this like a commercial for Illinois Department of Tourism or something when I was a kid. And I ended up on a horse on a tiny little bridge going over a gorge that dropped down. It's a place called Starved Rock. And uh, it's like a, a state park in Illinois. And it's this huge drop of a waterfall. And, and there's like this little bridge. And that's where I, that's where I learned to ride a horse was, <laughs> was getting, <laughs> I, I should have known better. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you, you, you lie to get a job. So, and then, <laughs> but they like knew we were lying. So they like already built in the, the this hockey camp thing. So this is kind of, okay. We, you know, sure you can skate, but we're, we're going to send you over yeah. to this bit of training anyway. Yeah. And then that's where we would go to school and then play hockey four hours a day. Yeah. And I have one last little bit of trivia, which is, which is more of a question. Do you know what cake eater means? It's used quite a bit. <laughs> a cake eater is a term for um, uh, for mostly people from Edina, Minnesota, or a similar suburb of like Minneapolis and St. Paul that is like known to be I don't know traditionally affluent. And so you would say like a cake eater is like they eat cake, just like uh, you know uh, um, what's her name in France, uh, Marie Antoinette said, "Let them eat cake." So like that, if you really want to dive deep into the etymology of the word. Uh, it probably has its sources there, but it's all about, uh, it's an affront, like a, like a class, like a, like a class thing, you know, like you're, you're a cake eater, which means, you know, you come from a diner, you're rich and you're not a member of our team. Like the middle class. Oh yeah. The vanishing uh, middle and lower class. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we want to dive deep? Is this the kind of podcast where we're going to get in the income divide? <laughs> 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 no, we won't go that far. <laughs> Cause I'll go there, man. <laughs> <laughs> so okay so we will now dive in to the mighty ducks so we open up with the prologue and we get lane smith who is brilliant in this um, and he's brilliant in everything i've seen him in i loved him in my cousin Vinny as well and we get the classic the if you miss this shot you're just letting me down and the whole team down too all right Gordon, it's up to you I don't want to see any goats around here after the game. You got it? Now, you missed this shot. You're not just letting me down, you're letting your whole team down, too. Which is the, the classic go-to villain coach. Did you get to work with Lane Smith at all? I, I did, yeah. I got to know him uh, very well. He actually would hang out with my dad a lot. They've got to be pretty tight. Um, and uh, Lane uh, originated a lot of great, roles in the American theater and in the canon. Uh, so he's a, like, he's a legendary stage actor in, uh, in America. And uh, I got to know him later on in life when he was uh, sick too. So I knew him as a, when I was an adult and uh, just a class guy uh, always through and through. Uh, he was a member of the actor studio, which I'm a member of. And so I remember running into him at the actor studio as an adult and 
and uh, and I forget that for him, probably Mighty Ducks was just a movie that he'd done amongst a hundred other movies. So I come up to him, but for me, it was like a seminal thing. Cause I was like, hey, and he he didn't even remember who I was, but then I, he kind of had that like look of oh yeah yeah, and then he kind of figured it out. But uh, he's a um, you know he's a just a legendary uh, character actor. So um, yeah, he is a perfect antagonist in this. Oh yeah, is his great his whole delivery his demeanor. I'm sorry to say it. But I think that the Hawks might have the better jerseys. I know that that's crazy to say, but the, his jacket, everything is super dope. Is that controversial, Matt? Have I just broken our new bond? Oh, man, I. Uh, I mean, it, it sounds like you just got a villainous streak. So uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> you know, tempered by your like, you know, British dialect, which makes everything sound a little like, you know, nicer. But still, I mean, you're a villain, you know. <laughs> All, all villains in in U.S. films are British or Russian, aren't they? Yeah, so, or British and Russian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the word, well, he's dressed like a British Russian right now. Yeah. So. I mean, I, I think what's really great is if you actually know the sport of hockey and you watch the way that shot happens and all of it, it's just kind of laughable. That's what my favorite part about it all is. It's just like, it's not really that good. <laughs> 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 you know, that was so... I actually have it written here that like there's so much pressure on young Gordon Bombay to make this penalty shot, but actually him missing just sends them to overtime. Which probably turned that kid into some Bitcoin guy, right? He was the guy who invented Bitcoin. <laughs> Serious! The dude who played that part was the guy who got involved in all that like uh, weird uh, could, like. Wait, you're being, you're being serious. I'm being dead serious. I'm being, I'm not joking around. Yeah, you should do it. Yeah, you should do some deep dive research there. Uh, wait, <laughs> wait, so young Bombay got involved in Bitcoin. And... Oh yeah, yeah. Was one of the, uh, was one of the uh, original faces of like uh, PR for the whole thing. Wow. Yeah. So just imagine if that shot had gone a quarter inch to the left, there might be no Bitcoin. <laughs> the the infamy of it all is, uh, I think, and I think you know he's a he's an interesting uh, character. We'll say he was uh, in some in some press. I just pointed to Dom because I have uh, I have his trading card up. We're in my office right now, up on the pin board, as lo as well as your trading card from Color Smith. Were you aware that you have a trading card? I did not know this. Not the whole team, just some of the select players have it. I'll, I'll email you a picture afterwards. Oh, you're going to have to send it. Yeah, I have, I remember uh, somebody made like um, art versions of it at a Comic-Con thing one time. And then somebody had kind of made their own, which was really cool. And I had a copy of those, but I can't imagine you having that. This is interesting. I'm curious what they are. Yeah, they're really cool. It's like double sided. It has like little facts about it. It has you written down as Lester Averman. So I don't know if that's a hundred percent confirming that the Dave. I, I Dave. I went in the witness protection, and but I and so that's why they changed my name. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll uh, I'll for sure send you um, some pictures of that. So we move from this opening prologue, and with the the opening credits are very sort of like diehard lethal weapon like they are quite serious opening credits yeah and a score by was it thomas newman i believe i think thomas newman did the score for this one of the newmans did yeah um the uh uh yeah it's pretty it's pretty serious <laughs> <laughs> the, the music throughout the whole film is so good. Like I love, I love that it's being treated with this seriousness. And I think, like what you were saying earlier, the fact that it was originally a bit of like a darker film, more of a drama, kind of bleeds in. Even though that it's been, like Dom said, Disneyfied, it still holds some of these darker tones, which I think makes it more classic, so to speak. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, it's about fighting for the little man and the uh, the underdog and the one who's not fixing and rigging the system and somehow finds a way to win it all because uh, one of the teams got the measles. <laughs> yeah, we, we've got that. We'll come on to that. I mean, there's still a nod to the original script because obviously Coach Bombay gets gets the DUI, so drinking and driving and, and is pulled over and that's that's what kicks it all off. So, I mean, that, that's kind of the, the dark passage, as it were. <laughs> Yeah, he's like gone down the wrong path, right? He loses his dad, you know, he's uh, super competitive. He wants to win everything. And uh, and he's, uh, you think about this in the 90s, right? In the context of where we were as a society that everything was about like, you know, success, success, success. So it's like, it's a, it was a, it was a social commentary, I think. For sure. 
We then move into Gordon in the courtroom, being quite cocky, um, and as as you said earlier, with Steve Brill as his uh, opposition, and Gordon is like finding loopholes and uh, is quite sort of condescending to Steve Brill's character, but I guess it's showing some of his sort of arrogance, I guess. And then we move to Gordon uh, back at his office, and he's talking to his PA, Jenny, who for some reason is typing on a typewriter, because why not? And, uh, and we're introduced to Ducksworth, and then as Dom said, we get to Gordon with his drinking DUI, which had a great line, which I only just sort of registered more recently, where the police officer says, breath, blood, or urine? And Gordon says, no thanks, I'm full. <laughs> yeah, he's driving his Corvette. That's it. I- I'm assuming that these were days that, like, you and the other sort of ducks weren't on set that they these were filmed separately yeah we were probably all inside trying to stay warm <laughs> <laughs> it then loops back around and we go back to the court and it's the same judge and this time steve brill's character sort of gets the the upper hand and gordon gets uh, sentenced to his community service and we sort of get to ducksworth saying that he wants gordon to take a break and to learn about the value of of teamwork and sort of grounding him again. And I always think that the guy who plays Ducksworth just kind of reminds me of the American version of Emperor Palpatine. (laughs) (laughs) He's quite uh, memorable, isn't he, Ducksworth? He looks he looks wealthy. You imagine him having a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, he might have been a cake eater. <laughs> Certainly. Absolutely. We move through to Gordon being driven in the back of the limo from um, Beardy from Lost. Did you ever watch Lost, Matt, the TV show? Oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's one of the others on Lost, and that was... Uh, Yes. Yeah. Uh, he's a great actor. He's also been in a ton of stuff too. And, uh, and is perfectly cast and in a really great role in the movie for sure. Excellent. Yeah. He's, he's great. We then get the introduction to the ducks. This is where, uh, we get some great dog poo commentary by Averman. Um, and in this section, I actually noticed that it's actually kind of shot like as if you are going to be sort of in the Charlie position. Like it's kind of shot with, you're in the center of the frame and you're doing a lot of the, you have most of the lines in this section. I mean, do, do you remember shooting this this scene? Yeah, and then I think they discovered that I just couldn't carry the movie so they gave it all to Charlie, <laughs> I think after that. <laughs> it's, their preju- it's their prejudice against, against guys with glasses, even though those were fake glasses. Even though this is funny because I wear real glasses, but those were fake glasses. That, that's how they were. I remember that was like my first day on set, um, the first few days, and uh, so our introduction to like making movies was like a, was like an obstacle course and a stunt man and like, you know, all this amazing stuff and a gag and us having fun. I mean, it was like, I was like, if this is making movies, I'm in. So that that that's what I remember about that sequence. Nice. Uh, I actually think, I didn't check this, but it sounded like it actually had uh, some of the music from Home Alone in like the sort of sped up bit. And I thought, well, if that's true, that's a great little tie back to, to you. <laughs> yeah, maybe they maybe they were like trying to get some, uh, uh, some yeah, trying to get some of that. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I def, I, it kind of sounds like it's an old classical song of some type. That's yeah. it, yeah. And then we get the, the scene of the limo driving onto the lake and being introduced to the rest of the team, one of which is uh, Jussie Smollett, who obviously was incredibly sort of in the news, etc. last year. When he went to Subway. <laughs> I, no, I remember, I remember that um, that wasn't really a lake. It was a park where they filled out like an inch of water and um, like made it like, you know, in the Midwest, you would do that like where you... You just put like a little bit of water down and it kind of has this like fake lake of feel and that's what they did so it wasn't really a lake just fyi ah oh, cool that's a good that's a good uh good tidbit there we then have this great sequence where jesse is thinking that bombay is a drug dealer and which is quite heavy for a disney film and he's saying that uh he's going to use his eyeballs as hockey pucks and then he thinks that gordon bombay is packing heat yeah oh for sure well yeah he's like this crime boss that's showing up It's funny. I remember like that was our introduction to like making, we kind of shot a little of the movie in order. And I remember when we did that sequence, it was record breaking cold. And um, 
the camera was freezing and I think we were all realizing, oh, what are we really in for for shooting a movie in Minnesota? Like literally the camera was like frozen. And um, so like, uh, and then, you know, we're all like kids going, we're on a movie set. And the adults are all like, oh my God, we're gonna, they're gonna shut us down. They're gonna shut us down. Oh, this is a lot of money. Oh, and we're like, hey, cool, let's skate around. <laughs> you know? You know? <laughs> so uh, uh, it was a, that's, and so that, I just remember that scene being a lot of fun because of all the different, you know, we were all there and we got to rock the limo and that's the infamous Goldberg, uh, the goalie, uh, you know, uh, farting in the, I mean, it's just, it's everything about that scene is just perfect. Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot of dialogue in, in these scenes with like, by the way, we really suck. And then Bombay says, I'll decide who sucks around here. To, to my adult mind, that sounded a bit more questionable. Yep, yep. And then you are credited at this point or uh, as Dave Averman. Do you ever remember it being discussed that your name would later change to Lester? Or was that just, you know, like a continuity error or something? Like I, like I said, I think it's because they put me in the witness protection program. No, I... Um... Uh, I, I, my assumption, and this is only an assumption, is that um, there were clearances that were made because every time they make a movie, they have to clear a name. And sometimes if there's somebody who's actually in like each production company or studio will clear every reference, everything on frame, just to see, they want to make sure they don't get sued. Um, and there might've been a Dave or a Les Averman or whatever in that particular town that didn't want uh that they had to track down and didn't want that information or his name or that. So that sometimes that's what happens. Nice. This is where the, the team starts a scrimmage and then you're doing the commentary over the top of it. And I believe, I don't know if it was the same in the US as it was in the UK, but I believe these are parts that are actually used in the trailer. Because if you remember like back in the day with the VHS tape for like other movies, uh, I always remember the ducks being, uh, the trailer for the ducks being on there. So I could sort of remember the the trailer over and over again, and you were in it a lot, especially the the line as well of "Do you enjoy losing?" and you know, or not at first, but once we get the hang of it, like that is classic. And I remember that being in the trailer. Like, do you remember being like happy to have been featured that much in the promotion? Uh, no, I think I just remember being happy that I managed to spit the line out and not puke. I think as <laughs> well. <laughs> Just on Emilio's shoes. Uh, or, or, or totally freeze with that. Like, and somehow like go, like every, every actor has that terror of, cause like terror of filmmaking is something's going to get effed up and I just hope it's not me, you know? And like, you know, there's like, <laughs> there is a little bit of that whenever you make movies. And so I, I, if I really got honest with you, I'd be like, I'm just really glad I got, you have that like, uh, okay, we got through it. There's, there's cold. They're losing. Okay, okay. We just let's just let's just get it done. And then uh, and you just hope to God it's it's uh, uh, it's somewhat funny. <laughs> that's that's what I remember. <laughs> well, you definitely succeeded with that. Uh, this part, Charlie's mum, who I have for all of my notes, Charlie's mum, but I think her name is Casey, isn't it? I, I think mm -hmm. the film. But she comes in and sort of ruins the fun. And then we move to the first D5, District 5 versus the Hawks game. And it's very, the Hawks are very military-like, doing their sort of chants and... Uh, the, the one, two, three slide. Yeah. One, two, three slide. Isn't Hot dog, dog, hot dog. <laughs> hot dog, dog, Did they particularly, on purpose, make, make like the Hawks kids, like the actors... Did they try and make sure that they were better skaters and that sort of stuff from the beginning to try and give that disparity? Well, I mean, it wouldn't take much to be better than us at that point. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, they were, yeah, they had huge hockey auditions and they had the pick of the litter of people in Minnesota because obviously it's a big deal in Minnesota. Um, and uh, so, like, they, I remember they had hundreds and hundreds of people show up to to be members of the different teams and the idea was they wanted to get um, people who played junior A hockey in, in Canada and college hockey and were just like 18 because then you can work them longer, right? Because if you're under 18, you can only work a few hours. And so they wanted people who were like 18 years old, but not too old looking. And then, um, and then so they were, they were bigger, you know, so everybody was way bigger than us too. And uh, so that was, uh, 
to quote Averman and Ducks too, they were bigger, they're faster, and they had more facial hair. So <laughs> <laughs> I love I love that. So Gordon then cat before the game starts catches up with Riley and there's just some great uh, exposition tied in here and some really great line delivery things like I wish they'd take that one down and we see the banners and there's just the one there that is like the runner up. Yeah, I think it's like great writing, little subtle jabs. It's 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 like public shaming at its best. Yeah, totally. I love the line where Bombay says something like, you know, have you got any, who's your hotshot player this year? And he and Riley says, oh, we've got this kid Banks that might go all the way. He's not quite as good as you, but he wants it more. It's like that last little line is like, oh, <laughs> nice little jab to the, to the chest because he's saying it to his face. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's uh, nothing says love. <laughs> So we then cut back to the prologue just to have a little reminder of the trauma that this little Bitcoin kid went through. <laughs> we then get to Bombay trying to get the District 5 team to copy the win chant. Win, 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 win. And then uh, they're going on to sort of getting like, destroyed by the Hawks. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment. <laughs> it's... Yeah, we're uh, we're like the the Polish cavalry uh, in World <laughs> War II. It's not good, you know. <laughs> Just like irrelevant. And, and well, actually, if you really, it's really interesting because like it, you really think about it, there's like some serious child endangerment going on. I mean, Goldberg's got like newspaper <laughs> tied to his legs. There's like a we kind of have this Mad Max like uh, a man. Like if you really pay attention to what we're wearing, there's like almost like a road. Like what's that? The um, the Mad Max road road warrior thing. We just um, you know, there's football helmets. There's a, you know, it's it's just not good. We're not. We shouldn't be out there playing playing a high contact sport. You know, so it's <laughs> it's not good. It, the fact that yeah, you look like survivors from a post apocalyptic wasteland. Yeah, <laughs> playing ice hockey. <laughs> yeah, but somehow yeah, still playing hockey. Yeah. There's a line uh, in this scene that I'm not I'm not sure whether we would get away with these days as as much as uh, we we would in the early '90s, where three players from each team face up, and McGill from the Hawks says, "Oh, the Oreo line, <laughs> the Oreo line, yeah, exactly," uh, which absolutely uh, I had blanked that one out throughout my entire childhood, and then watching it back recently, I was like, "Oh my God, can we?" Can we get away with this? I don't know. Well, clearly you did, but um, now I, I think I think we'd struggle with that one. Yeah, that that would not fly. <laughs> <laughs> Were you like aware of that that was what it was at the time, or was you just sort of knew that that was like an insult? Uh, I mean, I thought. I mean, yeah, it's an insult. I mean, uh, I think that was uh, definitely meant to be racist so i think that was the intent you know that the villains would do that uh but you're right that would not fly today but actually in the context i think while they were shooting that i was just chasing after paul abdul so <laughs> yeah, i'm not on set i'm not they don't want me i'm not playing and i can't play hockey i mean that's literally like i'm trying to stay in the context like you gotta remember your kid and like, the bagel machine. Right we were such a distraction. <laughs> They're shooting a scene, yet we're trying at the other end of the rink because it's free ice time to play hockey. <laughs> you know, right? and if you're not playing hockey, you're trying to get some jam on a bagel and time your time your bagel hunt to look like nonchalantly, like I'm gonna get a bagel and Paul Abdul's over there. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, we get the sort of famous, the Avon in the eh, ba da ba da ba ba da ba da ba ba da ba da ba ba baseball so that was kind of always a bit foreign to us but could see but that was always one of my favorite parts is that something that was in the script or did you sort of improv that or did they approach you for it but it was originally it was originally a cricket and rounders reference but we figured that just wouldn't fly <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> that would have helped yeah uh no that was all that was all in the script the way it was um and uh you know, I think it comes from what was uh, popular with um, 
David Spade and all the Saturday Night Live people and all that stuff. So it was a definite. That's what, it, you know, that was literally word for word what was written. Nice. Well, now Dom and I, Dom doesn't know this, but we'd like to audition for you. I will be auditioning for Gordon Bombay and Dom is going to audition for Lester slash Dave Averman on this next line delivery. And you let us know if we'll get the part. Ready? Got it. Go. You think losing is funny? Well, not at first. But once you get the hang of it. Did we get the part? That was, that was really good timing, man. <laughs> I actually did not know that was going to happen as well. So. <laughs> you, you even had the like the the like broken uh, timing thing that that I do totally. Yeah, that was good. Just good memory, I suppose. <laughs> but thank you. Um, I'm, I'm actually honoured. I mean, if this was one of those like reality shows where where you know like where we all wear masks, like the masked singer, I would say um uh you would definitely advance to the next level and we'd have to kill the other one excellent <laughs> so i'm dead yeah. give him the 13 million yeah gordon sees the the magical uh hans watching from afar and on this viewing i thought is it possible that hans is actually just a figment of bombay's imagination is not actually real and maybe he's sort of fight, fight clubbing him into existence. This this is back like you in high school. This is your your this is your thing, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I need therapy, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> like psychosis has become a thing. Yeah, it has that like nostalgic feel. Yeah, like they uh, um, he's going back and in, into his roots, you know. Uh, and then he falls, and he falls for the gag. You know, he falls for the um, cutting your finger on the sharpening the ice. You know, or sharpening your skate. So, and he's the only one who goes in through the back door. You know, it's it's all. I actually really love that scene too. I actually think all of those touches are really. It's a really delicate undertone of really nice writing and shows vulnerability, and it actually releases Gordon Bombay's story sort of slowly to the audience like every time they go back to the prologue you get a little bit more information that sort of gives you more information about the character and I think that all of those touches make it a really well-rounded movie oh yeah oh yeah I mean he uh like it starts to explain the cautionary tale of like uh never lose what what's really important to you I mean that's why I think that movie is so good you know I think jo- Joss Ackland as well in that yes. in that scene in particular has a fan- he's well as in all the films that he's in he has a fantastic voice just the way he uses it just so calming and grounded so like it's like you see him in films like he's in Lethal Weapon two uh, and he's like the bad guy and he yeah he's a super villain yeah 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 he's in um, Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street and he's kind of the bad guy that becomes an almost good guy and uh, in this he's like such a nice guy. <laughs> And that he's just the way he changes his voice is so soft and, and really well spoken and and you kind of you sort of fall in love with him a bit as well like Bombay has. Yeah, he's like the moral center father figure of it all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We then move to the ducks being sort of bullied by the hawks with like the women's catalog sort of in the back alley and we're introduced to Fulton who we've seen in previous scenes sort of watching the first game. And then there's and there's a joke that would also probably not fly with a PG movie about having sex with one's mom. <laughs> yeah. Is, and uh, and that's where a carp ends up in the gutter, and then um, and then Fulton comes out and saves the day, uh, and we get introduced to uh, the mythical figure of 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 him. Yeah. And he sort of, to me, is like, uh, he sort of reminds me of like the, the old man from Home Alone. Just to bring up, just to loop it back to Home Alone again, he kind of like saves the day and just sort of grunts. Unfortunately, due to Matt Doherty's really busy schedule, he's had to leave us halfway through the podcast. So we will carry on. But his analysis so far has been top notch and fantastic. And some of the memories and some of the bits that he's saying have been super funny and great. So we're honoured to have had him on the podcast, but unfortunately he's had to go. So we will carry on, just me and Simon. But we do have his final thoughts at the end of the podcast that he did leave us with before he left. And some insight into the Disney Plus reboot of the Mighty Ducks, the TV show. So stick around, listen to me and Dom go through the rest of this movie and you can hear what all of us thought about it collectively at the end. So we now get to a point where Coach Bombay is teaching the Ducks to cheat. He's like, 
having them doing these military sort of chants of take the foul at hurt get indignant one more time i'll say it again take the fall at hurt get indignant one more time take the fall at hurt get indignant good you guys are ready do you remember this bit i do remember this bit yeah um because they're all sort of facing up against each other as well aren't they and they're going through the chant as he walks down the middle of them down on the ice. Uh, and I had forgotten about this as well. I'd forgotten that they that he trains them to cheat, which I thought was quite quite a strong sort of way to start. I suppose now that we know the the origin of the film, him being a bit of a like an alcoholic and having all these problems and stuff like that, that that was like an easy road to go down. And it's about overcoming adversity and, and all of that and pushing to the next level and, and becoming stronger and better and, and all of that. So it's kind of it's nice that they still included that and you have to be at that lowest point where even these kids are saying to you, No, we're not here because of Charlie that says, I won't cheat and I'm not that's not what I'm here for. You know, I'll I quite happily play and be rubbish and always lose, but I won't do it by cheating. Um, which I think like fair play and that's like that's a really kind of like that's the key moment of the film isn't it where Coach Bombay turns and becomes this well, actually I'm actually quite interested in this now because this kid has made me think I could be a better person well and it ties in nicely to the beginning of the film where Gordon is trying to find loopholes in his DUI and, and all his court cases it's like he always tries to take shortcuts so it makes sense that in this peewee hockey league that he would still try and find a way to just get to the win which again makes sense because as a child through coach riley that's what he was taught is you go for the w you go for the win so again the writing ties back to him as an adult and it actually is it's actually really well written mm. like it, it ties together really succinctly Absolutely, yeah. And from it, like any sort of Disney film, you, you kind of think it's about fun and entertainment and family, but there's always a message, and the message in this is, you know, you've got to do it the right way and the honest way, and at the end you'll win. <laughs> well, one, one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> Not by cheating. Right. You... No, I mean, like, I, I'm by and you'll win, I mean, on a... On a moralistic like, level. On a moral level, yeah. <laughs> so, so then we get District 5 versus the Jets. And this is where District 5 players are getting in trouble for cheating. And then, as you said, Conway won't cheat. And this is the whole eye bit where Bombay is like, just reach for your eye as if it's cut and then hit the ice. And it's a, it's a nice moment. It's well shot where Joshua Jackson is looking at Emilio Estevez and defying him. And he actually does the smart thing. He uses his skate to pass the puck out. So it's not like he didn't even lose possession. So I don't think Bombay really had a leg to stand on there. <laughs> Definitely. We then move to the changing rooms and Gordon shouts at Charlie. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> <laughs> We as the audience. <laughs> this is Smart House all over again. Everything ties back to Smart House. Peach cobbler. <laughs> oh, this is a good moment to remind our listener. No, the one listener we have. Dave. Hi, Dave. <laughs> if you haven't checked out our pilot episode, Smart House, then now is a great time. Well, not now, after this. So there is a changing room scene, is that better? Where Bombay shouts at kids, mainly Charlie, and Charlie leaves, Jesse leaves. The characters that leave, leave in protest because they don't want to cheat. And the the dad... Jesse and... Tyler? <laughs> Tyler. It's not Tyler. <laughs> Jesse and... Jesse and... Is it Terry? Terry... Well, it's not far off with Tyler. Jesse and Terry. No, yeah, Tyler is close. They were, yeah, they were leaving protests, and Jesse and Terry's dad comes in, doesn't he? When they, as they walk out, and he's like, "I didn't miss overtime to watch my kids cheat. What, like, what are you doing? I, I want to watch my kids and be proud of them." 
And what's the point in us coming to watch this, you know, awful display of just not absolutely zero sportsmanship? And they're not even trying. So I, I might as well just, I could have earned some money out of this today. You know, I've gone to work. I think you've ad libbed a little bit here. I think it was just one line. It, you sound really concerned. Wait, he's upset. They're... He's come to see his children succeed. That's true. And all they've been told to do is take a dive. That's what he says as well. I don't want to come see my kids taking dives. And that's got to hurt, like diving onto ice. <laughs> <laughs> so Gordon goes to see Hans, whether he did or not. We don't know if he's alive or real. Sharpening skates. This is a scene that Matt touched on. And we get a bit more exposition into Gordon's dad's death, which is really sad. Hans says that Gordon missing the penalty shot and his dad's death are not connected but because they happen at the same sort of time in Gordon's life, he feels that they are interwebbed. And this adds to some of his pain of being involved in the hockey world again, which as much as this is it's a comedy and it's a kid's film, etc., it has that grounding and foundation of real emotion. Yeah, it's not just silliness, is it? It's, it's, quite, it's quite a powerful message, isn't it? And actually, it does... There were subjects that you wouldn't always expect from a kids film in 1992. You you would think that it would be a bit more silly and slapstick, like when they were falling over and smacking Goldberg in the legs with the hockey sticks and stuff like that. But actually, it's got some you know really sort of touching points that probably mean a lot to people and, and understand. And, and that the scene with hands, like we said earlier, is is really important. And he's kind of he's that almost like his grandfather he's become that father figure (laughs) (laughs) why are you laughing now what happened there all I could think about is Hans Hans. (laughs) booby I'm your white knight Hans booby I'm your white knight it's not die hard we're not doing die hard the mighty ducks I think it's that I'm so sad that Die Hard was in the late 80s that we're never going to be able to cover it. Unless we do an 80s podcast. That. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I guess. That's true. We could do that one day, but the 90s is our jam. Hans, Bobby, I'm your white knight. Sorry, you was on a really tender moment there about a powerful moment in the film. Ruined. So this is where, this is, <laughs> oh, oh God, this is where, <laughs> why is his name Bombay? Why was the film going to be Do called you know Bombay? It make, isn't, there's, there's no reference to ice hockey there. Like as in, I don't, the Mighty Ducks, Ducks team, you kind of get it. You know, his name's Gordon Bombay, isn't it? There's two types of gin. Gordon's. I promise you. Oh, Gordon, Gin, and Bombay Sapphire, Sapphire. or something. Yeah, that's that's why his name was put together. It's two different types of gin. What? Yeah, that's, but what's that got to do with ice hockey? Nothing. <laughs> Hans gives Hans gives Gordon a pair of Hans gives Gordon <laughs> Hans gives Gordon a pair of skates. Nine and a half. Gordon, pretty bratty, is like. Well, actually, I'm a size nine. Nine's is like, wear thick socks, Gordon. Yeah, you're getting some free skates, mate. Douchebag. Just like... take them and shut up. <laughs> we then get a flashback to young Gordon that we now know is some Bitcoin millionaire uh, with memories on the pond with his dad. And he's playing on his own. He's sort of doing self-commentary. It's, I think it's really well shot. It's like a nice memory. It's got a good sort of filter over it. It's, it's like a sweet moment. I mean, one of your favourite moments of Celtic Pride was the commentary bit that Dan Aykra did. Was that, that have a nice little ringer to it? Pop, you? Yeah, young Bombay didn't have a gun to his own face. That though. is true, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a really sweet moment because I actually, I remember like playing football on my own in the garden 
and like you're sort of doing that like pretending to be like West Ham players and things and kicking it against the fence as if that's like a one-two and the more I talk about it the more it sounds like my childhood was just me on my own just making up things and just not being loved and as much as my parents have told me they said that that's not the truth but the more I unearth the more I'm concerned that I've just been living a lie and I'm now using this podcast as therapy <laughs> Well, welcome to the What's in Simon's Mind podcast. Uh, <laughs> Did you ever play on your own? No. I had friends. <laughs> <laughs> you. So, so you are real. Yeah. You're not. That, <laughs> I'm, I'm not like throwing my voice and doing this podcast <laughs> on my own. <laughs> <laughs> so after the memory, we moved to Gordon going to Charlie's house, don't we? To make moves on his mum. Basically, yeah, but it's essentially to to go and apologise, isn't it? He wants to go and say sorry. He wants to go and say sorry, and he wants to go and, you know, tell Charlie that he was absolutely right and cheating isn't right. He needs to put things right with this kid because he seems to be like the leader of the pack, um, like the team, kind of the team captain, isn't he? And it's all about that, you, you, you know, this, the spirit of it at the end of the day. And he's Bombay goes to his house and kind of trying to make amends is it the mum that answers the door yeah it's the mum and, and she's, she's like, cold at the beginning yeah, doesn't we're not, let him in we're not interested and tries to like close the door and he's like whoa you know and kind of talks his way in doesn't he and then you know the scene you know carries on for a minute and they're having a chat and he's talking to Charlie and he actually literally like basically uses a pickup line through Charlie doesn't he he's like so what kind of men did your mum like isn't that... No, that's later. That's that later in the out, diner. Sorry. He he eases his way in before just fully trying to extort his relationship. <laughs> Potentially bribery of letting Charlie take that last penalty shot. Yeah. There's some sweet moments in here where the ma- he's asked Casey, Charlie's mum, if they can have a minute to talk. And she goes into the kitchen, but she's listening on the other side of the wall. Gordon's trying to find like the right words to apologise and then she's just like, you're sorry. And he's like, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay? And it's sort of like a bonding moment in two parallels to Casey and to Charlie. Yeah, absolutely. That's the turning point of Bombay as well, isn't it? Where he goes from being this quite tough lawyer type that isn't interested other than winning and getting the W. And... It gets to this point where he becomes the little bit softer, a little bit more understanding, a little bit more caring coach, really, and, you know, friend, rather than just the, the nasty guy he was at the beginning. I actually like, this may be an unpopular opinion, but I didn't, I don't like him. I don't like Bombay. Throughout the whole film, I think even, by, even once he's arced. I think by the end, he's all right, but he's not, he's not my favourite in it. What did you think of his performance? Was that like part of what you were saying? Or were you just saying you just didn't like the character? I, I actually think his performance is, is okay and is, is quite good because I don't like the character. I don't... Emilio Estevez I have no problem with at all. <laughs> but um, Coach Bombay, I, I really don't like him. I watched the film and I, uh, the This is the sort of film that's put on at Christmas, isn't it? Or on a Sunday afternoon. You think it's that quite nice sort of family film. And you watch it and you think, oh yeah, Mighty Ducks is great. It's loads of fun, especially watching, you know, the kids play the hockey and, and they're whizzing around and, you know, they're getting battered and it's like the true underdog story and they overcome adversity and they win. Great. But I really don't like him throughout it. After, like, as a character, I just think, this guy's a bit of a bit of an ass, really. <laughs> I think, just not, even when he changes, he's still a bit stroppy, isn't he? But, you know, he he does get a bit nicer, but... Yeah, I just, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I I understand. Yeah, I get completely what you're saying. I mean, now as like an adult, I really love Coach Riley. He's probably I know we're not there at that point yet, but he's probably my favorite character because he, his voice and delivery is so great. But he's like the epitome of the of an antagonist. It's played. It's pitched at the right level. But when we get to Mighty Ducks two. It loses a lot of the sort of darkness. It's a much more like shinier, you know, more glamorous Hollywood sort of bubble around it. Where, you know, most sequels, they feel like they have to push the envelope further. 
and the characters have to become sort of more caricatures of themselves, etc. And that is really evident in Mighty Ducks too. But saying that, it's like my that's my favourite one because I think that one would came out in '94, so I was, we were like seven, eight when that came out. So that's like right in there as like a pivotal, you know, nostalgic sort of period. And the antagonist in Mighty Ducks two is ridiculous compared to Coach Riley. Like Coach Riley is still like a, a person, you know. We're in the second one. You'll see what I mean when we get to that one eventually. But Wolf the Dentist Stanson is the name of the antagonist in the second one. Can you remember the second one at all? No, not not really. The first one is the one I've got, you, you know, the memories of. I can't... I, I'll probably watch the second one and then think, oh yeah, I remember that. But yeah, but right now I can't remember any of it. Wow, well, it'll be interesting when we get there. Then we move on to Bombay going back to see Ducksworth whilst he's suspended from work and he asks for money so he, he realises the team haven't got the equipment and they haven't got what they need it's like Matt was saying earlier that you know it's like a child protection issue where Goldberg has got newspapers attached to his legs to try and protect him um, so we need some proper padding and shielding and ju- just general equipment including his gates to, to get these kids actually being able to play properly uh, so he goes back to see Ducksworth and Ducksworth says, well, how much is this going to cost? And Bombay says, 15 grand. That's like $1,500 per kid if there's like 10 kids on the team. I suppose if you haven't got... If you're a parent of a kid that wants to play ice hockey and you live in like District 5, you're not going to be able to pay for that, are you? So because that, We'll talk about it later when we get there because the, the, the reasons there are districts is, is because that determines what team you can play on doesn't it essentially what part you know of the league you're in and stuff like that so and they're obviously from a part of town that isn't that wealthy which is why they haven't got the kit and all these old jerseys which are horrible so he's asking for this 15 grand to you know obviously kit him out get him out fund him and he, does he mention getting him in, getting ducks with his own shirt yeah that that's what that's what gets him it he says yeah <laughs> i've written here all he needed was a jersey and he's sold <laughs> and he's like i'll get you your own jersey he's like okay <laughs> then we cut to hans's store spending the money so i actually think it was just a scam <laughs> because <laughs> gordon's <laughs> getting this 15 grand but he actually only needs like 500 dollars and the rest is going in Hans's pocket. <laughs> but as we know, Hans isn't real. So that's actually Gordon's skate shop. That's just a wild theory. <laughs> but it's uh, this is a nice scene. And we get some exposition on Fulton, where, where some of the players are talking amongst each other. And they're sort of getting to the myths and rumours. Oh, I heard he's got a football scholarship to colleges. Oh, he's not allowed to play, you know, contact sports. And Fulton is there for some reason because he just stalks these kids, <laughs> and he's like helping get a hockey stick out of one of the like display stands. Do you not think he's like their kind of their guardian angel, like a little bit of a pro- protector for them? Because he he turns up and and saves them when they sort of get him picked on in the alleyway, and he sort of looks after them in the shop, helping them out, you know reachings they can't reach are you theorizing that fulton isn't real no <laughs> uh, and i think he sort of plays that kind of older brother kind of part if it's quite well but he's got that silent doesn't really talk demeanor hasn't he well did you know in real life fulton the actor that played him and guy germain uh were brothers or are our brothers and Fulton had to actually, they dyed his hair darker so that they, you know, wouldn't look sort of similar. I did not know that. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. Because is he, is he blonde? Oh, because I suppose he's, he's a younger brother in real life and he's really blonde, isn't he? Yeah. So is he blonde as well? I'm assuming so, yeah. I think he's in, I'm thinking it, about he, it, he's in loads of other stuff, isn't he? He's in the butterfly effect. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, he is blonde, isn't he? All right. And they dyed his hair. And dyed his hair, yeah. Well, did, did, was that like a production choice, or was that his parents, or...? No, I'm guessing it was a production thing, just to try and distance him. But also, he's framed as being, like, really big, but in real life, he's, like, five foot six, five foot seven. There's nothing wrong with that. 
It's an honest height. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Bombay recruits Tommy and Tammy at the ice rink because that's okay to do in the 90s. Well, yeah, just approach some, some children who are unattended and get them on your ice hockey team. But the reason he recruits them is because they're like figure skaters and he essentially needs people who are good skaters. He doesn't necessarily need good hockey players, but good skaters is, is always good. And then he can coach them and train them into being good hockey players. We then get to a training session and Gordon's taking the ducks back to the basics, skating. We get the infamous egg scene and uh, with the soft hands and then the sailing the, the eggs across which I, as a kid I always thought was like a great sort of teaching technique I'm sure they wouldn't teach that to actual kids thinking about it now because that must be quite hard to get broken yolk off of ice right yeah I would have thought so it's going to involve a lot of scraping isn't it <laughs> <laughs> but it, I like the let it let it like slide towards you and ease it in and catch it and yeah like so it's, it's kind of a good early training technique because what kid is it that gets covered in it carp yeah so like uh bombay moves the egg like plays the egg across the ice to him and he basically receives it and receives it on target and it just like smashes all over him and he's covered in it um and that's when it's like no you've got to like gently ease back and you know take control of it and stuff like that and then this is where you know the coaching really starts to get going doesn't it and it's it really starts to feel like they're becoming more of a unit. And it's funny you saying that you didn't like Bombay as a character, because these are the moments that I actually really like him in. And I actually really liked him. I liked cocky, arrogant Bombay at the beginning. Yeah, I really warmed up to him by by this point. I think because I I just didn't like him <laughs> from the beginning, because of his, his attitude and, you know, he's... He's just got that sense and that aura about him, hasn't he? That you know, I'm I'm a winner, and it doesn't matter what anyone else says. I'm a winner, and you know, some people like that, fine. But I th- I think he's made to not be liked, isn't he? Mm. Uh, and then he's made to be liked by the end. And I think because I just really didn't like him at the beginning, I just still didn't like him by the end. So if anything, it was too convincing at the start that it was too far to sort of make a recovery to for pull you. him back to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We then get Goldberg tied to the goal, which is iconic. And they have sort of like gun sounds over the top as if he's sort of being shot at. They leave him there <laughs> tied to the goal, which is classic. These, this, this, is, this is one of the more like iconic, infamous scenes. And then he starts like moving off. Doesn't he go, guys, guys? And he's taking the goal with him. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Is this when... Is it, do we then move into Coach Bombay? Going takes Charlie home. Yeah. So yeah, Bombay takes Charlie home. The mum's watching them from the window. From, yeah. Yeah. Just like kind of watching them come back, thinking, "Oh, this is, you know, he's getting attached. This is that he's getting attached to a, a guy, and I, I don't want, I don't want you to break his heart, kind of thing, isn't it? That's yeah. it. They're like play fighting, and she's seeing that he's getting this positive male role figure in his life. And, yeah, I guess that puts more on the line of pressure for that relationship, which hasn't even really started yet between her and Gordon. Yeah. Gordon and Beardy from Lost are driving and Fulton smashes the window of the car. So Gordon, of course, recruits him. And it's it's it happens all of a sudden. I'd forgotten that happened. So when I was rewatching it, it actually made me jump. Because <laughs> they're just driving on casually and then it's like, bang, and the window's just completely smashed to bits, isn't it? Well, Beardy is actually pretty brave because seeing that happen, you might have thought that was a gunshot, but he reverses back to like see what's <laughs> happened rather than sort of speeding off. So I think secretly Beardy was packing heat in he's the glove going box. Back for, he's going back for more. <laughs> yeah. It's a good introduction to Fulton. He actually doesn't dispel the rumours of whether he's got a scholarship or not. Like Gordon basically asks him and he just says, people talk, that doesn't mean anything. Hmm. I've always wanted to know, well, does it? Like, did you have a scholarship? I want to know about you. I I think it's one of, you know, when the kids say, oh, he's got this scholarship, when they're in the shop, and so he's got this scholarship and he can't play and he can't do this and he can't do that. I think it's all rubbish, isn't it? Because maybe he's, because he's a bit of a loner, isn't he? He's not really, 
he doesn't really appear to have mates. That's why he kind of, I think, hangs around with them and looks after them. Just wants to join in, but no one's ever said, hey, do you want to come and play? It's just become that myth or that urban legend that he is, you know, he's going off to, to be a college footballer and he's going to do this and he's going to do that. But if anyone, if someone had just said to him, Trent's playing some ice hockey, he would have been like, yeah, I love, I love ice hockey. I, I, I have any play. Uh, we also missed out uh, a slight bit of when they're in the store, in Hans's store, buying all of the stuff that Peter, with his little leather jacket... Cap on backwards. Yeah, <laughs> he spots the article about Gordon missing the the what could have been the game-winning shot in the Pee Wee Championships in 1973. And yeah, more importantly... He's a hawk. And, of course... You know, if that's who, if you were a hawk when you were, you know, nine, then you bleed that hawk black and white blood. <laughs> so Fulton says to Gordon that essentially he can't skate. And Gordon says, oh, is that all that's stopping you? And then we move through to a classic 90s montage of the Ducks, or District 5 still at this point, rollerblading through the Mall of America, more hijinks ensue. Some poor, poor woman, middle-aged woman, gets knocked into a fountain. <laughs> There's a guy who gets his like donut nicked as well? Or... Yeah, by Goldberg. <laughs> yeah. And somehow Fulton manages to go down like two or three flights of stairs and miraculously stays balanced. And I don't think I would have been able to go down one stair without breaking both my ankles. Yeah, same. These are nice moments, and Gordon's teaching him to, you know, move his legs and how to skate, and these are these more sort of 90s Disney family vibes, aren't they? Yeah, the um, the little montage in the middle is that, you know, oh, it's quite fun, really, kind of moment. We then get to the unveiling of the Ducks jerseys, and we get the little speech from Gordon talking about... You ever seen a duck fight? They they all look a bit confused by this point, don't they? And it's just like well, no one, no one messes with with a duck. Yeah, what's what's the answer? The answer is no. You've never seen a duck fight because ducks are the toughest animal, you know. Out That's there. it. Yeah, <laughs> they're they they're on the pond, and if anyone messes with them, then they all band together. You mess with one duck, you got to mess with the whole flat. Yeah, <laughs> and that's where he like pulls off the jacket, and he's got the the jersey on. There's some nice little jokes in there. Ducks don't even have teeth, neither do hockey players. <laughs> Once they've revealed their sort of shirt and who they're, where the money's come from, this is actually where we lead to one of my favourite lines in the film. Um, because Bombay, it's all question why they're, they're why it's ducks and stuff like that. And Bombay says, I didn't have a choice, we're being sponsored. So basically, the guy that's giving me the money, we're going to put his name all over it. And Averman says... By who? Donald and Daisy? And that, that, that's it. Ah, I think that's brilliant. It's not only a little like little nod to other Disney characters, but he, he, ducks, essentially. Yeah, it's I love good. the fact that, that he comes up with that as well and he just sort of throws it out and it's it's a really, really good line. Uh, the, the silly lines and the funny lines are, are like my favourite and they pretty much all come from Matt. Amazing, yeah. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> His great comic relief. Fulton is the first one to say, I'll be a duck followed by Charlie, followed by the rest. And the jerseys are awesome. I really like them. Obviously, green, which was our favourite colour as a kid. And, yeah, really dope. And to this day, things on, like, Instagram and online, I think at hockey games, you still, today, have people wearing, like, replicas of those green Ducks jerseys. Did you ever have one? I didn't, and that's a tragedy. Oh. That's not good. I mean, you've got an original one, not one that you would wear. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't have a green one. The green ones are, uh, like, gold to find. Adam Banks is one. We haven't spoken about Adam Banks yet, because he hasn't really come in yet, but his green Ducks jersey went on auction, I think in, like, 2016, 2017, uh, in America, and sold for about $2,500. Wow, big money. Yeah, but it's Banks. Here's the best. <laughs> when we get to our first game that is the Ducks rather than District 5, it's Ducks versus the Cardinals. And to warm up, they're playing American football. And the Cardinals, or some, a player from the Cardinals is says something like, what a, what a strange team. <laughs> Which I thought was a really good line because it actually 
wasn't like mean or anything. They're just like, what what a weird team. <laughs> we don't understand you. Because <laughs> it actually seems like all of the other teams in the league, as we sort of go down uh, and, and into these different games, they're all actually nice teams. It's only the Hawks that are like these antagonists. But that's come from coaching, hasn't it? The coach who's essentially supposed to play that role and make them the the evil nasty team aren't they so they're, they're the bad ones and nobody wants to play them because they always win and they're not particularly nice so they're the bullies and yeah the the bullies of the league but it's quite fun playing the other teams because although it's competitive they're kind of all right really aren't they and and they're quite happy to play and they just get on with it whereas yeah like you said the the hawks are the the nasty bully ones yes <laughs> it's just <laughs> I love it sometimes. I just realise we're having such serious conversations <laughs> about these. About my ducks. About when they're playing the car- Cardinals. This is where Fulton is like doing his warm up, isn't he? And he's just they they tip the bucket of pucks onto the I was gonna say the floor onto the ice, and they're like, okay, ready? Just like go for it and smash. It. And he's just actually smashing all these pucks all over the place. And uh, it's one in five, isn't it? Is the one in five goes in and then he he hits the post and he smashes some glass and it's just going all over the place and then yeah that that one in five is like okay that's that's the average of how how much you're going to score every time you you hit one of these pucks uh, I actually quite like that bit and it just shows how powerful he is and how how strong the play the the player is and the Cardinals are watching this and are terrified they're just in fear absolute fear. We then get the first quack chant, which, because from before, the Ducks were trying to mimic the Hawks with the win, win, win chant. This is where we get the, we're Ducks, we're not District 5, Ducks are undefeated, and then we get the quacking, which actually ties towards Cool Runnings, when Cool Runnings do that, when they're doing the bobsled and they're trying to mimic Germans and they're going like, eyes, bye, rather than when they obviously later do their own thing and we get for the rhythm for the ride give it up it's bob's their time cool running <laughs> it makes me really sad that you didn't know oh uh, i've not seen that film for years and years and years oh no <laughs> <laughs> your wish is my command <laughs> Oh, it's my choice this week. It is. It is. I look <laughs> forward to whatever war epic I've got. <laughs> so we get the first duck chant. Sorry, we get the first quack chant, and then Carp takes a puck to the head. Oh yeah, it actually dents his helmet as well, doesn't it? <laughs> and he's like proper out of it. <laughs> Carp died that day. <laughs> there we Maybe get some. He, um... Has some damage to his frontal lobe. Pretty sure he doesn't have a frontal lobe left. <laughs> well, we get some good comedy moments of, Carp, how many fingers am I holding up? Oh, he wouldn't know that anyway. You know, <laughs> things like that. And Bobby's like, shut up. <laughs> it's good moments. Fulton helps the Ducks get a tie by pretending to shoot. And as he sort of winds up, there's like 30 seconds left, he winds up and all of the Cardinals just sort of like move to the side because they're scared for their lives. And the other duck sort of take the puck and just sort of glide it in, which is a great moment. It's nice. Yeah, it's quite funny when everyone's just ju- absolutely jumping out of the way because they're just in fear that this could go anywhere. <laughs> and the goalie actually like gets out of the goal. <laughs> just take it. You can have it. <laughs> we then cut to Gordon talking to Hans about making the playoffs. And this is where Hans says that one of the teams has got the measles. They're out. They only they, all they have to do is not be in the bottom two to make the playoffs. This is where Hans is talking about the fact that they redrew the district lines, as to what you were alluding to earlier. From that point, that he realizes that he would have been a duck, isn't it? So he knows that actually, well, after the redrawing of the district lines, that his old house falls under duck territory. So he would have been district five or a duck. So he kind of. This is where he starts to feel, I think, feel like less of a hawk. Bombay, I mean. He starts to feel like less of a hawk. 
uh, and is really getting into the spirit of being a duck. I actually never thought of it like that. That is really good. <laughs> yeah, of course. Now he can associate himself that he would have been District 5. He would have been a duck. My God, the writing on this. <laughs> Steve Brill, Liant. <laughs> <laughs> well done. No, that, that's, a, that's a really good... I never thought of that. Nice. Thanks. And then he starts to play lawyer games, doesn't he? Essentially, with the other team. Uh, and he identifies that one of, the, one of their players is within his district. Their best player. Their best player, Adam Banks. Then is essentially transferred over. And, like, although that kid earlier on had been one of the bully kids and stuff like that, he's then just, he then goes, I just kind of want to play hockey, so I don't, I don't really, don't really care who I play for. Because his dad steps in, doesn't he, and says, my son's a hawk and has always been a hawk and will always be a hawk and well, it's either that or he won't play. And he's got that face of, like, shock and, no, no, I want to play kind of thing, but it doesn't say anything. And then it's just like, Do you know what, let's just, you know, see how let's see how it goes. But I, I just want to play hockey. Coach Riley is like, "Come on, you must be kidding." We, you know, he's always played for the Hawks. What's what's your problem, Bombay? And then they get to their confrontation. Kind of, yeah, it's like a real moment of. That's my. It's one of my favorite favorite scenes. But, but before that, Bombay has the the punchline of, "Well, Banks can stay playing for your team." But if he does, you have to forfeit every game for the rest of the season. And he yeah. says something like, oh, wouldn't that be a shame? Like, he just sort of sticks the knife in where he's still got some of that arrogance and cockiness. Just before we go on to this confrontation, were you saying that I'm, I'm him? Who? Ella Banks? Yeah. Yeah. Because that's like the biggest compliment you could ever give me. Because you'd moved to a school where you, <laughs> where you, where you didn't know anyone. And you're a bit lost and, and, and like, oh... So it's kind of like Adam Banks. You were taken out of somewhere where you were That's comfortable good. and happy and moved to somewhere where you were less comfortable and happy, but eventually you... I left the school because it was over. That's, <laughs> so lovely. That's so lovely of you to say. You're welcome. Right, so we get, to, we get to Bombay and Riley's confrontation, and this might be my favourite scene. This, this has a great bit in it, especially Coach Riley, where he's like... and he, In fact, he says... Why did you turn against me, Gordon? For six years, I taught you how to skate. I taught you how to score. I taught you how to go for the W. <laughs> and then you could have been one of the greats. And that, that bit, that must have hurt. Because he's just like, mate, you could have gone all the way. You could have been it. You were like NHL stardom. And then, and then, we're, we're back down. We're back down to earth. We're below earth on this next one because he's like and now look at yourself you're not even a has been you were never was I love that line wow it's so deep and the way he delivers it yeah you're not even a has been you were never was and his, and his hand movements as he's doing it it's just fantastic isn't it because that is so deep it's like you didn't even you're just nothing <laughs> you're not even I'm the only one that knows you are any good yeah and Adam Banks wants it more than you. And that's what... Mm. He's like, oh, as good as you, but it'll go further than you. It's essentially what he's saying. Why'd you turn against me, Gordon? For six years, I taught you how to skate. I taught you how to score. I taught you how to go for the W. You could have been one of the greats. And now look at yourself. You're not even a has-been. You're a never-was. This is where Gordon's saying about the ducks and he says, yeah, they don't even deserve to live and the kids overhear it. Overhear it. And it's obviously being sarcastic, but they just sort of throw that in as another hurdle to sort of overcome in the third act, really. But yeah, that, that scene is brilliant. Lane Smith's delivery, everything is perfect. His perfect casting. I love it. <laughs> it is great. He was very good at it. Taught you how to score. Taught you how to skate. <laughs> taught you to go for the W. <laughs> you could have been one of the greats. I taught you how to skate. I taught you how to score. I taught you how to go for the W. You could have been one of the greats. And now look at yourself. You're not even a has-been. You're a never-was. But now they can't... Oh. Oh. 
<laughs> I really do like this scene, don't you? Hans! Hans! Bobby! <laughs> You've got so much editing to do. <laughs> so we get to the changing rooms for the next game, and Bombay tells the team about Adam Banks and that he's going to come over and... Peter tells the rest of the team about what he heard Gordon say about them being losers. And this could have been explained away pretty quickly by Gordon. Really. Yeah, well, like, when he comes in, he could have then just been like, like, what's the problem? And then, well, they all said all this stuff, like, we losers and we deserve to die and stuff like that. It's just like, no, guys, you don't understand sarcasm. I was taking the meat, you know, I was just saying to him, oh, they're losers and, oh, we should, we should just die, blah, blah, blah. It's like any classic Shakespeare play, though, isn't it? Is that every Shakespeare play could be done in one act oh. because it's all about deceit, isn't it, and not telling the truth and and not and not being like forthcoming with something that's happened. So Bombay not turning around and saying, "Guys, it was just sarcasm," has then added that extra bit of tension, an extra hurdle to get over. And every Shakespeare play is exactly the same. So, so my ducks is Shakespeare. It's literally like someone is got this secret and they won't tell it but all they'd have to do is let it out let someone know and all these problems go away end of play end of film job done but no Disney is smarter than that mm. <laughs> so it just kind of keeps the ball rolling for a little while doesn't it and that creates that tension again and it creates extra tension because that's when they link Banks to Bombay isn't it yeah, he says something like, guess you hawks stick together or something like that. Yeah, because then the little guy, Peter, makes mm. it clear to everyone that Coach Bombay was a hawk and he missed mm. in the, his final game. and He choked or something. Yeah, and it, it becomes a thing for them and then they all storm out. But you know what I realised just now is the fact that when we look at the banners in like the rafters, right then they won, like, every season, right? Every season for like, the last couple of decades. So Gordon, at some point, must have won a Wee championship with the Hawks. He just didn't win that year, right? Like, he, I'm assuming that wasn't his rookie season. Like, that's his first... Like, he must have won the season before, the season before that, right? He must have done, yeah. But he just... They lost that one, and then he quit playing hockey, we find out a bit later. But, but he must have won previous ones. Otherwise... He had the most amazing rookie season of all time. <laughs> of his life. Right, so he must have already won a championship. Yeah, he must have done. If he'd been a hawk for a couple of years, absolutely, yeah. He'd, he'd won a few times. The team abandoned Gordon, except for Fulton and Conway, and then the Ducks have to forfeit against the Flames, and the Flames win. Yeah, he says to the ref, doesn't he? Oh, they're just getting like, uh, like they're working themselves into a frenzy. Yeah, they they're geeing themselves up basically, and then those two come out on the ice and sort of skate around a bit. They throw their helmets on the ice as well, don't they? Is that a thing? I think maybe they're just. just while they're up? I think just while they're warming up and just don't really need it because we're not going to be crashing into each other at hundred miles an hour, or whatever. So that's it, and the referee goes, "Oh yeah, okay." Really get really into a frenzy or something like yeah, that, isn't it? Or... Some sort of some frenzy, yeah, something like that. So it's just like ducks forfeit, which is quite a sad moment. It's... It doesn't make me like Bombay anymore, though. No, <laughs> <laughs> Bombay goes and sees Charlie and Casey, uh, Mrs. Conway, at the diner where Casey works, and this is where we get some exposition about what happened and. Gordon's talking to Charlie about when he missed the shot and, you know, a quarter of an inch the other way it would have gone in. And Charlie says, well, a quarter of the inch the other way, you would have missed completely. And he's like, well, I never thought about it from that perspective. So they, they, these are like nice moments that, again, ground the film. I think it's almost that half glass half full, glass half empty conversation. Even though Charlie's saying, look, you could have missed it altogether. He, he's making a, a fair point, isn't he? He's... he's He's been more pragmatic about it, isn't he? And he's trying to say to Bombay, actually, it's it's okay. It's all right not to win all the time. And, you, you know, we've just forfeited a game and it's fine. We'll, we'll move on and we'll, we'll still keep going and keep trying to win. And he already knows that how many they have to win to, to get to the playoffs. So even if we don't make it, we've, we've got a bit better and stuff like that. And Charlie's, you know, trying to edge him that way, isn't he? And he's becoming the, the sensible voice of, 
of reason in the film, isn't he? Yeah. This is where Charlie says is saying about his mum that she has many qualities that men find attractive or something like that. Yeah, and then it's like, until they see me, sort of thing, is that? Yeah, and then, bam, they're gone, or something like that. Yeah, so these guys don't stick around, because they, they see me, and I'm too much hassle for them, sort of thing. Bless Which you. is sad. <laughs> yeah. We then we then move to the ducks in school, and they start a ruckus, and then they start quacking at the teacher. <laughs> I had a note in here for Matt to see if he remembered, but in that... Averman is getting noogied by Connie, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Uh, so they quack at the teacher, so they're getting some of their unity back. Gordon then goes to see Ducksworth, and we find out that his community service is over, but when he goes to see Ducksworth, Coach Riley and Adam Banks' dad, Mr. Banks, are there, they're old friends with Ducksworth, and they corner Gordon in trying to get him to withdraw his protest so that Adam Banks can stay with the Hawks and then next season they will redraw the district lines. So th- this is the scene where Gordon walks in and he sees the jersey on the wall that he, uh, Mr Ducksworth has been given. And uh, actually, do, do you know the, what the number is on the shirt? No. So it's 34. Right. And uh, the reason is that because... He was born in 1934. Oh, no way. That's amazing. Yeah, so the the actor that plays Ducksworth was born in 1934 and said, can I have 3-4 on, on the jersey? That's so, so that's what they put on. I hope he got to keep it uh, in so the frame, because that's awesome. Yeah. That's a really good touch. No, I, n- I never knew that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> little nugget as well. Anyway, so back back to it. Um, Bombay is then in there and says to Ducksworth... So he's being called there by Ducksworth to, and he probably thinks it's about the job and not being suspended anymore. Because we sort of glanced over that a little bit in the when we were talking to Matt. So he's probably thinking, you know, things are going okay with the kids. I've met this woman and, you know, things are working out there. All I've got to do now is, you know, get my job back and this is probably the moment. And then Ducksworth says, you know, you need to drop your complaint about you have to withdraw your you have to withdraw your protest and he says something like gordon are you prepared to lose your job so, uh, over some kids yeah. some game and then gordon says well, i have to ask you sir are you willing to fire me over some kids some game pack your stuff gordon I, I, what a moment as well and in front of so many other people because um, Coach Riley's there. The dispenser of his childhood trauma, and then Adam Banks is there. Yeah. Just to add an audience member. Like, why are they there? So awkward, but obviously, like, Riley's there because he's old friends with Ducksworth. And... Is it Riley's friends with Ducksworth? Or... Yeah, is that right? Uh, no, it's at Miss Adam Banks' dad is friends with Ducksworth, but we just maybe assume that. They've known each other a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, just in cahoots. Yeah. So they, they all kind of have a knowledge of each other and understanding of each other. And um, yeah, it's all become a bit awkward now, isn't it? They're bribing the Pee Wee Leagues. Yeah. And I think Bombay sticking up for himself is, is even more so saying, yeah, this is one for the little man, isn't it? So the whole time, like, the Ducks have been, and like, D5 have been the, the little man. And have always been the underdog, and this is that exact moment he doesn't need to be this big shot lo- lawyer anymore because actually he's found a bit more purpose. This is Gordon being tested on what he's learned and seeing whether he's going to falter or not because the old Gordon would have just taken the deal, right? Because he wouldn't have cared. But like you said, this is new Gordon that is, like you said, sort of fighting for what's right. Quack, 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 Mr. Ducksworth. <laughs> Which, ironically, he's quacking at his boss and the kids in school are quacking at the teacher, so you've got the parallels running there. Gordon then goes to see the ducks at school. They're all in detention. He, he basically smooths everything out with, like what you said, sarcasm. Do you know what sarcasm is? No! no. <laughs> so, yes, they do. Something I noticed watching it this time was that we get these sort of tender moments 
and Gordon goes over as he's walking around. He sort of stops in front of Charlie and says, I made you and I'm sticking with you, which is what Charlie basically said to him at the end of the diner scene. You know, you made us, you know, and so he's saying, I'm sticking with you. And as he says here, yeah, all of the ducks are cheering. But then Goldberg or Sean, Sean Weiss is next to next to Conway. And as Gordon says this like tender moment, it's meant to be a happy Disney moment. He rolls his eyes <laughs> like in the middle of the moment. Oh really? It's He's like I've had enough of this. <laughs> it's, but it, once you notice it, it's really off thing. I, just... I made you guys. I right, watch Goldberg. And I'm sticking with you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Really? That's true. That's a full eye roll. <laughs> oh. And Peter has a little sheriff's badge on his <laughs> denim jacket. What is he got that from? Because he's a sheriff. <laughs> oh, okay. Adam Banks enters the locker room. He brings his Hawks bag that has his hockey equipment in. Think, Banks. Think about this. I know, I saw this as well. And when I saw it, I thought, why would you turn up with a Hawks bag? But obviously, he might, might be the only kit bag he's got. It's a huge bag because it's like tons of equipment, but... <laughs> yes this is a lot of equipment in one bag yeah it's a lot of equipment it needs to be that, that big you'd have scratched off the hawks or something though wouldn't you yeah just put <laughs> something over it Duck turn tape. it inside out <laughs> <Duck>. <laughs> oh dear uh, Jesse has something to say oh I think Charlie goes to introduce himself and he says, on behalf of the Ducks, welcome. And Jesse sort of like stops him. It's just like, hey, yeah, like you don't speak for us. Yeah. And then he said, he said something like, I think he called him cake eater or something. Oh. We then get the Ducks versus the Huskies. Bank scores. Jesse hates it. And this is if the Ducks need to win this game to make it into the playoffs. We've got 30 seconds left on the clock. And... We have one play to go. They're tied, but a tie does them no good. They need to get a win. Bombay says to Fulton, at like a timeout, we're going to put you in. And they're thinking, oh, they're going to do that. The Statue of Liberty play, they call it, where he's pretending to shoot. And Gordon says, no, take your shot. Well, coach, one out of one or something like that. And he's like, it's okay, just do it. And then we get a little creepy pickup line <laughs> from Guy Germain. Who says, Soft hands, Fulton. Concentration, not strength. And he winks at the, the girl. But at Connie. Winks, at Connie. And is like, yeah. So and, that's, oh, let's oh. play that back now. Thinking of it as a double entendre. The first meaning, meaning about hockey. Now let's think of it in the other sense. Soft hands. Concentration, not strength. The geese is nine years old. <laughs> like, what's he playing at? can't be hitting on a girl that's like 12 and saying things like that yes. that's just shocking <laughs> quack 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 <laughs> this is outrageous but he's using it as a pick up line <laughs> he's using it as a pick up line which is Fulton takes a shot he scores it breaks the net it's that smashes through doesn't it yeah it was a great moment everyone's like why Dropped is that their first win you yeah, because I think they tied a game, didn't they? Yeah, and yeah, so I think this is their first win. Yeah, which Big is moment. which oh. is they go on a run now. And Fulton wins it. That's it. So Fulton wins, and then as like a, a playoff treat, Gordon takes them to go see the North Stars play, which is an NHL team, and the Ducks meet two players, and I'm assuming that they were actual NHL players. Yeah, I didn't find anything out about them to be honest, but. You know, when you have, like we did had in Celtic Pride, when you've actually got... Larry Bird. And... Yeah, the real the real article. There's always that weird sort of hint of bad acting that... Yeah, I didn't want to say it. But... Yeah, but it just kind of sits and you think, oh, that's an actual professional, but they're, they're doing their best and they're chatting. And, and they kind of offer... That's when they first offer Bombay the trial. Trial. Yeah, which actually comes to fruition at the start of Mighty Ducks 2. Oh, okay. Which, soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Hashtag soon. Oh, my God. And the Ducks are really impressed that they know who Gordon is. And they say, oh, I heard you became a farmer. Lawyer, actually, is what he <laughs> says. Just as bad. They're, they're having fun on the ice. 
they're pushing Beardy around on like a chair and it looks like genuine fun. Gordon Falls. It's got that great music over it. Do you remember the song? <laughs> you don't remember? Find it. <laughs> what's what's really <laughs> funny? Is that, <laughs> what's really funny is that there's been a number of occasions where you have done the music yourself from from a part of a film over like the last few podcasts, like you did on Celtic Pride. I think you did it on one other as well, and then you've gone and found it and played it. And there's been like a like it sounds nothing like it, but also sounds like it. <laughs> I don't know how you managed to do it. <laughs> it just seems to work. <laughs> oh, this one is a bit. <laughs> 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 At least this way, there's no, no like risk of copyright infringement. Because <laughs> nobody knows what you're doing. Let's have some fun. You got the accent. Joey the positive. Isn't the negative. That down to the affirmative. No best than Mr. in between. You got to spread your. Up to the bathroom. Up to the bathroom. Up to the bathroom. Hey. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh no. <laughs> You try it, come on. Nope. Oh, no, no, That one. Da, 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 da. It's all, all uh, on you. Oh, dear. So, Charlie then making Gordon and his mum dinner, and then he tells Gordon that he's going to wear the same underwear for all of the playoffs. It's lucky underwear. Lucky underwear, yeah. They talk about... <laughs> they talk about different players having, like... Lucky charms and lucky underwear and superstition. He, yeah, yeah, so he he kind of mentions that that's what he's gonna do, and Gordon's like, "No, nah, that's probably not a good idea." Or he says, "Or maybe I should have made dinner." Yeah, <laughs> because what does he think? He was just like rubbing his hands over his underwear and then picking out the pot roast. <laughs> like, what? What is he thinking? <laughs> do you know how much pride you thought his name was Truffle? <laughs> You're like, I thought I heard truffle. <laughs> oh dear, do you know it was Celtic Pride where I was this tired as well? You didn't tell it, Pride. You look like you were someone else. <laughs> like, your eyes were different. Like, they were like a shark's eyes. They'd just gone black. <laughs> we're coming up to the third act, if not already. Gordon and then Charlie's mum go to the Winter Festival. And then Gordon, a little bit eager... Wants to move into ice castles, yeah, with her. Planning on moving into the house. Which room's mine? She gets a bit upset though, doesn't she? Moving too fast, worried that is uh, Charlie's gonna have his heart broken. Well, which one of us is gonna get hurt first? That's kind of what she's getting at, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) I love you, me now. I love you now. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, All right, the ducks <laughs> beat the hornets, and this is what this is for the first time in the film. Apart from like the prologues, this is the first time we start getting commentary. So, in the Pee Wees, commentary is exclusively for playoff games. Oh, they're covered in the magazine, aren't they? They are covered in multiple publications. Yeah, I, I think it's the same magazine. Well, that they provide the commentary. That happens over and over, that pops or like up. like Pee Wee Hockey Monthly or something. Yeah, I can't remember what they're called. It's like, it says like the best for hockey news or something like that. Or like local hockey news or something. But 
I think that's like nice little touch as well. Yeah, and it's sort of the graphics they move in into the articles and through the pictures and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, this is the first time we start getting the commentary, and I loved this stuff as a kid. Like as a kid, I used to I'd watch these films over and over, but quite often I would just go to the end and just watch the final games because I like loved them, like how you loved war <laughs> with Saving Private Ryan and would like wear the tape out. That'd be like the same, but for you know fun Disney films that kids are supposed to watch. <laughs> oh, wow. Do it, do it. Steve, what really? <laughs> what does he say it's like Betty Boo uh, Betty Boo what a dish <laughs> is that what he says yeah <laughs> <laughs> I love that bit oh dear <laughs> uh, right Ducks ah oh, Beardy and Bombay so sorry so Ducks beat the Hornets yeah we get the commentary and then Beardy and Bombay have a great jig handshake did you notice it no Yes. Yeah. Then we move to Ducks versus Cardinals in the semi-finals. Ducks win. I've just put here Adam Banks is the man. This is where we get our first rendition of crowd support in We Will Qu- We Will Quack You. We then move to the publication you're talking about and we get like the face-off picture between Bombay and Riley. Yeah. And this is in 92. So this is predating the movie Face Off. So, (laughs) just saying. I love that. We cut back to the prologue again, but this time we're getting slightly more information. So each time we see it, we get a little bit more. You missed this shot. You're not just letting me down, you're letting your whole team down too. What pressure to put on a kid. I know. They keep cutting, like, putting more in, don't they? So... They'll add in an extra line that, you know, has been missed from his memory. But I suppose that as the film progresses, he's remembering more because he's getting into that, you know, feeling of it all again. And it's it's dragging up all these memories and stuff like that. And he remembers what it's like to be one of the kids that he's now coaching. And I suppose the further along he goes, the more memories build up and come out and... He has that sense of, um, I don't know, what has he got a sense of? Well, it's sort of culminating and innating into a crescendo. We then move to the final Ducks versus Hawks lineup and the stare off. They're going down, the national anthem is playing, and we sort of get each duck and each hawk one at a time. And then we get McGill, the head evil hawk. He's really like smiling and smirking at the ducks, like it's li- like at Adam Banks. So they're sort of bullying him as well, aren't they? Now that because he's, he... he's turned now, hasn't he? He's but, become one of them, which is harsh because it actually it's not his fault, was it? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. So his house is just in the wrong place. Yeah, <laughs> ha! You're poor now. <laughs> like you can't be our friend. You're not a cake eater. Yeah, exactly. Eating scraps from District Five. Oh gosh. All right, the Hawks, so we end up get to this final game. The Hawks are just way more physical and they dominate the first period. I think the hockey is really well filmed. Like, it's very easy to follow. And I really like the sort of sound effects and you get the sort of whooshing as the, the hockey sticks are coming through and precursors a lot of the action. Like, you see the players before they're going to, like, rush in and bump into banks and things like that. Like, it... It's easy to follow. Yeah, definitely. And we- the, the games are, like you said, really well shot because you, you see all of the action and you see the whole of the ice and it's not like they're going to film one tiny bit in the corner, they will fly past and then they've got to move. It, it flows really well. They're obviously, you know, very well put together film. Adam Banks' dad, however, is still sat in the Hawks section and rooting for the Hawks. He's still got like a Hawks jacket on and all of these things. Why? Why why is his loyalties to this other team that his son no longer plays for? Might be a benefactor. He's got money involved. Guy's got money. Yeah, he's got money involved. Okay, that makes sense. (laughs) Banks is like the only player that they have. Riley gives the orders to drop Banks and he does get dropped. We've got to take him out. Yeah. When uh, Banks gets hit, and then his like head sort of goes into the post. I always that always like made me sort of made my spine go as a kid. And now it's nasty. And then one of the hawks 
he sort of sat with him and he's like, what'd you do? Yeah, he, he sort of says, oh, my he's job. Saying, is it, you know, he's still our mate. Yeah, he's still you a know, kid. He's still a kid. Why, why have you done that? And he's exactly like you just said, he says, it's my job, and then disappears, doesn't he? He gets, yeah, put into like the penalty box. And when he goes back over, Coach Riley sort of gestures like, yeah, strong. Like He's got no remorse to it. Which I guess adds to him being. And Bombay sees it as well, doesn't he? Yeah. I think he notices it. Yeah, and then this is where Bombay confronts Riley, and this is a, a great scene and great line delivery as well. And he says, "To think I wasted all those years worrying about what you thought. You're going down, Riley." Powerful stuff. But it is though with the music. It sort of then dun dun, and it sort of starts picking up. Like this is the turning point that. No, you can't win because you're cheating now and you already have, like, the better team and the more money and, and all of that sort of stuff. So Gordon's saying, you know, let's have fun out there. Fulton scores. We go to 3-2 at this point. Uh, one of my favourite lines, again, from Riley is, you blow this game and nobody makes the team next year. <laughs> the Hawks score. We're at 4-2. Tommy and Tammy score four three, and that's done in the the sort of figure skating, yeah, high jinks. In a, in that style, one of the hawks then knocks Tammy over, and then Fulton goes over and literally lifts one of the hawks and throws them into their own bench, oh, and sort yeah. of starts on the rest of the team and gets himself um, like sent off, doesn't he? To like the penalty box. Yeah, is that for? Is that on a time? I think you get like, like two, minutes. you get that, yeah, two minutes, something like that. Yeah. We then get introduced to the flying V, um, and Jesse's like reluctant to do it at the beginning, <laughs> uh, but this actually isn't foreshadowed at all in the film. This was its first introduction. And you would have thought they would have practiced it practiced in the montage in or something. And it's gone wrong loads of times. Like one of them at the back when the middle keeps falling over, or. The puck keeps hitting off their feet or something. You you would have thought they would have made more of it. I wonder if there's like deleted scenes or something like that. So we then get to the final few seconds of the game. Gordon saying, don't worry, we'll get them in overtime. Confident. Conway is then through on goal and he could win the game. He gets brought down and fouled. No time left. A penalty shot. A recreation of what happened in Gordon's past. Gordon gets to choose anyone that's on the ice to be able to take the penalty shot. He plays favourites, chooses Conway, when the, the rest of the team are saying Guy, because I think he's like what's known as like the next best player after Banks, though it's never really, not really shown or explored that much. And instead of doing it like how Riley did and putting all of the pressure on, Bombay takes the pressure away. You make it, that's great. If you don't, it's fine. You know, just we, we enjoy it. Kind of thing. Yeah. He strips the pressure off. And then Charlie does the triple deke. Slow motion. I love all of that. And this time it hits the post and goes in. So you don't have to worry about the uh, falling into overtime. You don't have to worry about overtime. It is done. Great music kicks in. And then everyone celebrates. Hans says he's really proud of Gordon. Gordon kisses Mrs. Conway. Huge trophy. And we fall to the final scene that Gordon is on the bus. Or Gordon is about to get on the bus to go to his tryout. The kids are lined up. They all say like a line each back to him of things that he's said. Soft hands, cake eater, so on and so forth. It's a nice way to wrap up the film. Kisses Charlie's mum in front of the whole team and her son because, you know, father. And then, <laughs> and then he gets on the bus and says, I'll see you later. And then he comes back and says, hey, Ducks, whatever happens, I'll see you next year. We've got a title to defend. Yes. Everyone cheers. And that's the Mighty Ducks. The Mighty Ducks is done. So, Dom, another one down. But let's talk about our judgments. Who's your favourite performer of the cast? Okay, so my favourite of all the cast, I think one that really stands out for me is probably Charlie. You, you know, he's uh, he's trying to be, he's trying to grow up, 
he's trying to be that role model. He's trying to be um, a good kid. He's trying to be a good sportsman. He tries to be the f- a friend. He tries to be cool, but he also tries to have a laugh. And he gets himself into a bit of trouble at school with the, the whole little fight and then in detention. And, but it all works out at the end. And I think he is kind of the linchpin, isn't he? Not Not just for the team, but for his mum and Bombay and stuff so he's kind of the that middleman linchpin that just sort of seems to make things happen without really doing a massive amount you know he's only got to say one thing or be a bit positive and he's kind of that character and I think I probably prefer him over Bombay because like like I said earlier <laughs> a couple of times I'm not really a fan of, of the character of Bombay throughout this so yeah I think I'm going to pick Charlie 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 Conway that's a good choice, and obviously Joshua Jackson went on to and is continuing to have a really successful career. Yeah, he did. Like, fringe is it Fringe? Fringe, yeah. He was in Dawson's Creek growing up, time, and then yeah. he's in. He's done a few other bits as well, hasn't he? But yeah, like, film and TV. Yeah, yeah. What about yourself? Who's the best cast member for you in this thing? So growing up, I would have probably chosen. Probably would have chosen like. Adam Banks out of like people that I liked and like Averman I I really liked and Goldberg but if looking at it from my you know an adult perspective my favorite performer would have to be Lane Smith I think he is great in that role I love his line delivery sometimes I just hear some of those lines in my head <laughs> uh, I love it I think he's perfect in that role and I, I love him in everything I've seen him in so uh, I'd say Lane Smith and I think if we were choosing, like, a secondary cast, he would be top of that list. Yeah, because I guess he's not he's not in the film... Uh, he probably feels like he's in the film more than, you, than he actually is because he's in the prologue that they keep flashing back to. Yeah. And then he's just sort of in some of those key game moments. Yeah. What's your favourite scene? Uh, my favourite scene is where they tie Goldberg to the post... Uh, and then they start flicking all the pucks at him and then they all disappear and go out and have fun and he's still attached to the post and, and still attached to the goal and he sort of drags it along like trying to get off the ice going, guys, guys, you know, ha-ha, joke's over kind of thing. Uh, that's, that's one of my favourite bits. What, what's your favourite scene? I like, we talked a lot about it earlier, but the confrontation between Bombay and Riley and Bombay, hey, Bombay, I'm talking to you, son. Because they that ties back later. He tries to do that to Charlie. Hey, I'm talking to you, son. Like he's trying to be Riley, but he can't. He can't be like that. But I love the. You're never worse. <laughs> That's my favourite. That is a great line. Like we said earlier, really well delivered. And what do you think about the music? Again, I, it's another one where I didn't really pay much attention to the music. I don't know why. It just didn't really resonate with me so other than your fantastic singing that song when they were watching the hockey game I didn't really pay that much attention (laughs) (laughs) we're never going to grow up are we no it's fantastic (laughs) oh dear (laughs) Um, okay would you recommend this film to a friend Yes. I would get someone to watch this. But if you haven't seen this, then you've missed out on one of the important films of the 90s, important kind of kids' films. But it has, like, some decent messages in it. So, yeah, yeah, get people to watch it. Or if if someone on you has got got kids or, like, little ones that are growing up or getting to that age that, like, we were when we watched it, if they're seven, eight, and, like, that area, then I'd be like, yeah, watch this film. Give that a go. Besides, like, the Oreo line and a couple other, you know, bits, soft hands, yeah. there's not, like, much that's too dated besides those parts. Like, it's reasonably safe, I'd imagine, to watch with kids. Would I recommend it to someone? For sure. What would you rate it out of ten, subjectively and objectively? Subjectively, I would probably have to agree with IMDb. Give it six point five. Scrap all of that. I'm going to have to disagree slightly with IMDb. I mean, I I would probably give it a seven point five. 
I think as a Disney film, it's got a lot of the you know characteristics of a of a great film where you've got that underdog story and you've got someone who's very sure of themselves and believes in themselves a lot even though they've had that one miss in their life and you know ties in with the death of their father and then he's not a good person he's just, he isn't is he but then does eventually become a you know a bit of a lighter character and and someone that you can you know you might be able to learn to like i don't like him but it doesn't mean you don't have to <laughs> yes um, and, and it is it's you know quite a heartfelt film but there's a lot of great comedy moments in it the kids are great in it you, you know and Matt who we spoke to earlier is, is great in it and is funny and so in his lines probably the most memorable so so, so yeah. your objective rating was 7.5 what should I say? so that was your objective view is a 7.5 what is your subjective opinion I'm going to give it an 8.5 I think it, it reminds me of what we were saying with Matt earlier, like playing hockey in the back garden, even though like we we're dreadful and it was more about battering each other with sticks than actually playing for any sort of goal or gain. But we always had fun and I like the film and it's that nice sort of Christmassy Sunday afternoon kind of relaxed. It's on telly all the time, just, just going to watch it. It's easy viewing, and yeah, I, I really enjoy the film. What about yourself? Like, what are your ratings for it? Objectively, I think I would give it a seven. I think is is probably fair. And then subjectively, I'd probably give it like a nine. Ooh. I would give it the ten, uh, but D two is like my was my jam, and that's probably like my subjective nostalgic ten. But I, I really do love this film. So we'll now cut to Matt, who will give his judgments and and summary of the film and what it meant to him and what it means to others. So enjoy. How would you rate the film subjectively and objectively? Like, as in looking back on the film now, out of ten, what would you? How would you view it? Well, definitely better than twenty three percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you guys, you guys have heard it, like, uh, and that I'll just reiterate that like, uh, I mean, I think the film, the reason why it, it survives is because of it touches, like you said, all those different colors. You know, the way, you know, you can relate. Most of us who are now in the status of being as the adult figure. We can relate looking back, being as a kid and now being in a way like a, the, the age of a Gordon, you know, where you're looking at like, hey, what did I, am I still, for the love and the joy of what I do. Do I, am I living that, you know, or am I this other thing, you know? So I feel like um, it's amazing how many times I, I go around and I'll hear people say like, they, they share this movie with their kids, you know? Um, and if you think about it, that's a phenomenon because I don't know about anything else today, seven, eight year olds, nine year olds, you know, they like them, they'll be like, they like this movie and it's old there's no con it's like something that doesn't exist in the last six months it's old <laughs> do you know what i mean so you think about like there's children today that i'm mean, gonna sit and i'll talk with them and they're like um and they this movie means something to them so like that's a phenomenon man so regardless of what you know rotten tomatoes or anything says it's and i you know the fact is it's touched a, a nerve around the world i mean i know people in australia uh, that love this movie, people that um, in Sweden, I lived in Sweden for a little while and, and who love this movie and it's not so, you know? So I, uh, um, I think that the proof is in the pudding and that speaks for itself because like you think about it, who doesn't relate, who doesn't um, relate to being counted out um, and then uh, coming together to beat the Hawks, right? And then who doesn't relate to maybe uh, going, wait a second, I need to, uh, man, I, I need to reclaim this thing that, uh, like one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie is when, when Gordon puts on his skates and skates again, you know? Mm. Yeah, nice moment. Brings it back round. I guess I just have two, two questions for you, Matt, before, before we let you go. The first one being, do you have 
any comment or any involvement or anything that we can leak as an exclusive on our podcast about the reboot of the Mighty Ducks series on Disney Plus? Well, I know is uh, that they're 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 doing it and they have everything like modeled out and written and it's all about um, another generation. And I know that Emilio's in it. I know Gordon's, you know, it's all hinged on him. And I do know that they're, um, it has to do with a lot of uh, what's going on in our world with uh, like girl power, like and this shift in our society, which is, which I think is really great and rings true to what the movie's really about you know, which is like, um, in a way, beating the Hawks. So the fact that like, um, that it's has a lot to do with like women hockey and, and, and girls and all that stuff, I think is really great. And I can't wait to see it. I don't, I know as much as you guys. And uh, they keep this stuff really under wraps because of um, what it would mean if something got leaked out. So that's as much as I know. We would feel robbed if we didn't see an Avon and cameo. So we'll still keep our fingers crossed for that. And then my final question anyway would be, in the future, down the line, on this podcast, if we ever get to the Mighty Ducks 2, can we count you in for a, for a return visit? Oh, heck yeah, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can count on it. I would definitely do that. Yeah, definitely count on that. It's been awesome speaking to you. This is strange. I will be quite overwhelmed later when I realize that we just spoke to you for like the last hour or so. So thank you very much for your time. Oh man, my pleasure. This has been a hoot to, uh, it's also really great to talk uh, when I can tell like that you guys have like, you know, really considered this and asked some great questions. So it's really makes it more fun to do. Thank you very much. And, and thank you so much for your time. And it has been, you know, great to to talk to you and feel like we've met you yeah i'll see you in your backyard or uh and then if this uh um coronavirus doesn't shut to everything down um i'm supposed to be in telford in april for uh, a comic-con there so if that happens i'll let you know that's awesome yeah we will definitely yeah definitely we can uh we can do a live episode (laughs) right yeah, exactly. So, um, but let's uh, let's keep our fingers crossed and, and get through these next couple of months of uh, what could be a little troublesome around the places. For sure. Yeah. Well, thank thank you very much. Take care, and we'll we'll speak soon. All the best. Oh, my pleasure. We're really grateful to have had Matt on the podcast. It was really great fun. Our first time having a guest, and he he was brilliant. And hopefully we can have Matt back again later down the line when we cover D2 and probably eventually D3. But for right now, Dom, you did the deep dive into Mighty Ducks. So it is now your turn to let me and our listeners know what I will be deep diving into for our next episode. Okay, so our next film that I would like you to deep dive into came out in 1995 okay and it's going to be the first animated film that we're covering wow okay. on the podcast it is toy story classic so i would like you to deep dive into toy story you probably get quite a lot out of it i think so yeah look forward to watching toy story again and seeing what you've got to say on it i loved toy story i remember being so excited when it was like coming on to home video and all of that so yeah great i haven't seen the first one in a long time as well so and i picked a film that's nice and (laughs) not for the weirdos and well there is the next door neighbor oh sin (laughs) sin (laughs) yeah classic okay great well that will be our next episode of the podcast will be toy story you can follow us on social media uh on instagram we are the Mighty 90s. That is 90S. And you can see all of our good stuff of what's coming up and pictures of what we've been covering. You can also visit our website, which is www.themighty90s.com. Our podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podbean, anywhere you find the podcast. Please help us out. If you like the podcast, rate, review, subscribe. If you don't like the podcast, just please hate us in silence and we'd appreciate that. And thank you all for your support. We really enjoy doing this and we appreciate you listening. 
yeah just to reiterate what simon said just thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us and um yeah give us a rating and we hope you enjoy it as as much as we do and we know that we we have a laugh with it and we hope you do too so thank you and we'll see you next time see you next time be gentle with us wear gloves (laughs) 